What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Golf 360 Podcast. I'm the host, Pete Popovich. So you may be wondering what Golf 360 is, and I came up with it and the name after spending over 30 years and a lifetime in golf in and around the game in all facets and levels, and I have come across, come in contact with, become friends with, learn from, pick the brains of, etc. a bunch of different people within the industry, outside of the industry, all who have exceptional knowledge, information, experiences, etc. to pass along. Uh, to make me better in the game when I was playing it uh, or outside the game in the business that I've been involved in uh, on the teaching side, et cetera. So because there were so many different people uh, that I had access to or and was fortunate enough to have access to, I thought if this is an all-encompassing podcast, why not? And it's golf-related. Why not call it Golf 360? So hence the name. Um, The one thing that I found out about all these people Uh, that are going to be guests on the show is they had two common denominators one they were very highly accomplished and exceptional at what they did in their field the second was they were more than willing to share their knowledge their experiences their pearls of wisdom uh, with me and many others uh, who were more than willing to learn and improve themselves uh, be it in their games uh, their businesses their life or what have you so I hope that you're going to enjoy listening to the show, uh, to each and every one of the guests that I have on the show, um, and that you're able to utilize information that they give, whether it's a story or an experience or what have you, so that you can continue to improve at your game and at life. This podcast is brought to you in part by Old South Golf Links. A short ride across a bridge from Hilton Head Island is one of the area's finest golf courses and a hidden treasure. Set up on towering pines and ancient oaks with sweeping march vistas, truly makes Old South Golf Links a -a one-of-a-kind golfing experience. The Clyde Johnson design was named one of the top 10 new public courses when it opened, and it also takes full advantage of the natural beauty of the low country. Old South is a fun and unique challenge for golfers of every skill level and a favorite of both locals and visitors. Whether it's your first time here or you're a regular, you'll be treated and feel like family. From the bag drop to check-in at the Fully Stocked Pro Shop with both men's and women's apparel, to breakfast or lunch before or after your round, the staff is always ready and willing to help. Experience for yourself why Old South is one of the premier golf courses in the Hilton Head area and why it will quickly become a favorite of yours too. Visit them in person or online at www.oldsouthgolf.com or to make it tea time, simply call the Pro Shop at 843-785-5353. Okay, I am very excited to have as my first guest on the show uh, a titan in the industry. He's a director of golf at Secession Golf Club in Beaufort, South Carolina, and his name is Mike Harmon. Now, Mike's been in and around this game for almost 50 years, and he has seen and done it all, and we talk about all of that in today's show. Uh, We start with how he began in the game as a a kid uh, and as he worked his way up into becoming Uh, a member of the PGA Tour in the early 80s and rubbing shoulders with some of the biggest and best names to have ever played the game. Uh, And then we follow his career as he segues from the PGA Tour into the club side of the business where he goes from walking the fairways and playing at the most elite level all the way back to the beginning where he is washing golf carts, washing golf clubs, and folding sweaters. From there, um, we get into his progress in in the industry side of the business where uh, he became – uh, the director of golf at Secession Golf Club, and he was very instrumental in the development and the building of that club from the ground up from day one. Uh, we also talk about Secession Golf Club itself, uh, the name, the unique experience that members and guests have when they go there, uh, the challenges that the club had in the early days, and of course the successes that it has today, plus a whole lot more. So I caught up with Mike during one of the busiest times of year, but in typical Mike fashion, he is always willing to help somebody out, and uh, and he made time for us to do this interview. So he gives a ton of wisdom. He tells some amazing, uh, great stories, and I hope you find this interview as informative and enjoyable as I did while talking to him. Okay, I'm here with Mike Harmon, Director of Golf, your official title? Yep. 
Okay, director of Golf Secession Golf Club. I don't know how you did it uh, this time of year in the low country, and especially at Secession, you fit me in for a second time. Uh, extremely grateful and humbled that you would think of me enough to, to allow that to happen. Um, so thank you for being here. Thanks, Pete. I appreciate it. Um, so as I tell people and that people ask who you're going to interview, um, and I tell them Mike Harmon, uh, some of them who are not in the industry, uh, the first question they say is, oh, you're going to interview Butch's brother? So is is there any relationship there <laughs> outside of share, sharing a last name? Well, I think there is. Um, distant. Uh, me and the boys have always chuckled about it. They call me Cuz. Uh, mm -hmm. Claude, the old man and just a legend, was uh, from Savannah. And I had family all over Savannah. I was from Atlanta. So uh, there's probably some distant connection um but uh no not one of the boys that's the that's the bigger <laughs> thing when i was playing the tour I'd, I'd i'd be in the northeast and uh um i was a rookie in my, my first swing up there and uh i would get asked 15 to 20 times a day how claude was doing well the first two or three i said no no that's 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 claude Harmon at wingfoot and i'm mike Harmon from atlanta there's no i'm not one of the boys or anything like that after about five or six of those uh somebody asked me how Claude's doing and i just said man he's doing great <laughs> <laughs> we just had dinner last just, night <laughs> they're not going into it it was too much air well let me ask you this question because th this one also came up quite a bit so your nickname is the old pro yeah how did that come about good question uh i started here um in 86 87 and and for some reason i was the old pro then i don't know i was 30 to 33 years old so it was hardly old mm -hmm. i think it was ol apostrophe at that point now it's just old did, did it maybe <laughs> start out as ye, ye old pro no nah, i don't think it was it could have been i probably had somebody say that but now my my old sign out there is just old uh, and i don't mind that at all just simple uh, and basic yeah i don't mind that pro and oprah i was playing at st andrews last summer and uh, walking down the fairway before I even got to Granny Clark's wine, somebody yells from the right side of the fairway, pro, pro. Walk over, say hello to somebody. Walked uh, another 50, 100 yards down, and I hear, old pro, old pro. <laughs> I look over, another guy from Chicago or something like that. So, uh, yeah, that's been the the moniker for a long time. I always get comments about the parking spot with the sign mm -hmm. in it. The, the, that's always gone over well. So let's go back somewhat to the beginning and how you got started in golf. Well, I was a I was a good baseball player. I was um, uh, I probably had a chance to to play at a couple of schools in college, mm -hmm. and uh, at fifteen had to make that decision. I've always given my dad uh, credit for that decision. Uh, he he said um, he said Mike, you can play if you're lucky. You can play baseball maybe till you're thirty competitively but you can play competitive golf the rest of your life and as an athlete that was a big deal um so i, I turned over and uh started playing golf was a public links player was my dad didn't play my grandfather had played but i um i uh, took to it fairly quickly as an athlete didn't know squat about the game didn't know anything about rules or etiquettes or traditions or anything mm -hmm. else. I was just kind of cutting my teeth in the early years, even through junior college. And, um, and, uh, won the state public links in 76 and, uh, that changed things right there, uh, in Georgia. And, uh, uh, Eastlake came along not long after and gave me a, a junior membership with the aid of my old coach, Jim Gunter, uh, a teacher in Atlanta and a member of Eastlake. And uh, so I had I had membership there for a few years until I turned pro. But did um, uh, continue. I wasn't really good in college. I I enjoyed college probably uh, more than I should have. Uh, <laughs> I um, I played okay in college, but it wasn't until after I got out of school that. Um, playing professionally that I really began to, to blossom as a player. And then we took off from there. Where did you go to college? Middle Tennessee. Um, had a full ride, uh, which was a big deal for me and my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, the old coach there, um, E.K. <coughs> e. Patty, was a delightful man. Um, well in his the end of his career, but he treated me so well. And... Um, um, I, I, oh, and, and allowed me, he always told me he'd give me a summer scholarship to graduate. 
and um, I did it took a little more than a summer, but uh, I did graduate. Love my final year there. I was just actually a student. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I didn't have to play. I didn't have to practice. Uh, was a dean's list. Uh, was a history international relations guy, and uh, loved just being a student for a year. But then I can remember going to the mini tours not long after that and thinking how much I loved not having homework. <laughs> <laughs> you had the best of both worlds. I did. Uh, did. Uh, and uh, so the amateur career was nothing, you know, outstanding. And frankly, the professional career wasn't outstanding. But I did eventually proceed to the highest level and uh, was always thankful for that. What was your uh, fascination with the game? Or did it not evolve until later on? I think I was just a competitor. I was an athlete, uh, and uh, I had to piece my way around that. Um, uh, Jim Gunter, the guy that I mentioned earlier, my, my owned a driving range near my house in Atlanta, and uh, he and I hooked up, and I began to learn kind of the fundamentals of the game from mm-hmm. him. He was a classic swinger of the club. Uh, and, and, but I was still on the, I didn't have any money to speak of. So I wasn't playing in the Porter cups in the North South. So I, right. I didn't do that. Um, played in a few events, but, uh, so I was fairly green by the time I got to college and, um, I never won in college. Um, but I, I think I was laying a seed at some point and, and what flipped it was playing professionally. Uh, I had the time to practice. I had the commitment I had the talent. Don't know that I had necessarily the 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 attitude, the 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 full belief in yourself that uh, that I see great players have, and uh, I just I had a work ethic and just worked my butt off, and uh, it ultimately paid off. Were, were there any lessons that uh, Mr. Gunter or your coach at East, Middle Tennessee State, and anything right. that those guys taught you, not so much about the swing, but let's say about the game that worked, helped you in life or that you might still use to this day? Uh, yeah, both were. Uh, Mr. Patty was, was well up in his year, so he and I connected more on life terms than, than golf terms. Uh, Jim was uh, just a good instructional guy, good player himself, but never really played. At the highest levels, and uh, so um, what I got from from them was the work. I'll never forget, in Middle Tennessee, there was a huge field right outside the athletic dorm, and um, I really cut my teeth in that practice field, shag bag, hitting my own balls, chipping my own balls to the bag, something that's a lost art mm-hmm. today. Um, when you're When you've got 150 balls out there, uh, you, you you just chipped them. Well, you become very creative, or you're bored to tears. So right. you began. I began to create taking full swings and hitting at 20 feet. You know that type of thing. And I I think it created uh, the short game that I had, which was has always been the hallmark of my game. Chipping and driving the ball were were certainly the my strong suits. But I think that was born out of that shag field. But my leadership, I, and that's probably where I I came up a, a tad short was. I needed someone to mentor me in, you should be playing in the Porter Cup, or you should be playing in the North-South, or um, uh, here's what you do when you do get your card. You know, I, I, I was kind of freelancing that because none of the people around me had done that either. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were wonderful, supportive, and we worked it out. We figured it out. And, uh, you know, easily the most important day of my professional's career when I, is when I went through the finals of a tour school. That, if you never play again, you will always be a former PGA Tour player. Yes. And, and it never signaled any, it was a signal to anyone uh, that that knew me that um, I played there, that I had gotten there. And uh, it almost, and I see this a lot in, in, in guys that don't quite make it. There's like this sword in their hand that they can't get out. They compete and they compete and they compete. They're always trying to prove something. Mm -hmm. And after I went through that tour school, I didn't have anything else to prove again, as far as a player was concerned. And I went on to play in club as a club pro and, 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 and competed well for 20 more years. But that day was hugely significant for me in Pinehurst. And I'll never forget that one. 
what was, was there a moment or, or what was it that that made you decide that yes you want to pursue playing as a profession outside of graduating and going into the business world good question i i can remember some of my teammates at middle tennessee talking about players and and I, of course i was no all american so they they had every right to uh question whether or not i could make it or not but i i remember uh being in an argument with them about uh or one or two of them about uh how you couldn't make it or i couldn't make it and i and i just remember the the statement that look those guys put on their pants just like i do Mm -hmm. and so i was just going to work harder that's all hard to be a student athlete and work as hard as you need to work to play at the highest level now all americans are extremely gifted and very right. good and they think right and and that's that 20 percent that are destined to be on the tour and destined to be the curtis stranges and the jordan Spees of the world mm-hmm. they're just that good the other 75 80 percent just need a break they're good but they need a confidence boost and um i didn't have that per se this was long before bob rotel and and the mental game and all that you just worked your butt off that's all and uh uh, my coach uh, taught that, and 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 that's what we did, and uh, it 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 paved the way for me to get to a point, but it wasn't enough to propel me to stay out there twenty years. And but as it turned out, that's that was all that I really needed mm-hmm. because it it did take that sword out of my hand of of having to compete all the time. And and these guys, I see these young, all the all the young guys, the Kisners, the Kuchers of the world have been through here, and I've chatted with them, and they will try to beat you out the door, all right? They, they'll they'll pound on you for thirty six holes during the day, and they want to play cards all night. They'll want to pound you at night. I was never that way, in this game. I I, I enjoyed the camaraderie of the game. I enjoyed talking with people, and that's really not the formula for making it out there there are there are some that that are that way but it has to be very focused and that was the mental aspects that i think i came up a little short in that pretty much kept me from maybe making a living out there who knows um but as i said uh in my world and what eventually evolved and that being this place um that was plenty that was plenty good enough for me so you you had told me the story before about Q School and Pinehurst. And can, can you kind of tell the people who are listening how, how Q School differed back in those days? I think there well, were two, weren't there? There were two, and fall? exactly. Uh, spring and fall. Uh, this was 1980. And um, I had, uh, this was the spring of 1980. I had missed in the fall of 1979 in the finals, my first uh, school in the finals at um, Waterwood in Texas. But kicking golf course, holy cow! I think ten over won the card there. I think I, I think ten over won the school four days. Uh, I think seventeen or eighteen over got the tour card. Jeez, that for those four days. What, what was um, the course? Waterwood National, okay. uh, kind of east and maybe north of Houston. Um, so I got to Pinehurst number six, which was a, a total butt kicker as well. A, a bit, a bit distracted i had i i I played my practice rounds in pinehurst flew to atlanta for the second stage of u.s open qualifying which was at um baltus roll in 81 nicholas won qualified at atlanta athletic club 36 holes on monday flew monday night to pinehurst to start the tour school on tuesday the next day Mm. got my card on Friday, but I, I'll never forget and Linda, my wife, uh, she was a classic on this one. I, I birdied the first two holes of the tournament and I've just qualified for the open. I'm, I'm on a freaking cloud. I played the next seven holes, nine over to shoot hmm. 77 and uh, the next, well, to, to, to turn seven over. And she came up to me She's a sweetheart. She never did this. She came up to me. She said, if you don't get your head out of the clouds, I'm going to pound you with that seven iron. <laughs> she said, she means she threatened to hit me with the seven iron. And it, and I made nine pars. 
after that. Mm -hmm. So it, it did kind of shake me loose because I had never qualified. I'd qualified for U.S. Public Links, which at that time you, you either played in U.S. Amateur or U.S. Public Links. They were segregated based on whether you were in a club or not in a club. Not many people know that. That's and the, of course yeah, the, and the they, public done links the went public away. Links. So uh, very very interesting. So um, I I'm now playing in the first round of a of a final tour school, but I my mind is wholly on what's going to happen next week. Mm -hmm. And and uh, she jolted me back into to shape pretty quickly and uh, went on to make it on the cut uh, right on the number uh, ten over. Um, made it even par won that one so it was a very hard golf course and i, and I tell the story about uh, the the final hole i was off the mark uh by a, a by a few because i started on the 10th hole they went one and ten mm -hmm. so it must have been a fairly compact crowd i remember Payne being there uh pain stewart um and several others that went through that school i think hoke was through there um the um I was on 10, so I finished on the ninth. Par, par four at number six, um, which in, it was in its infancy. It was it 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 was hard. It's kind of like TPC when it first opened. It was very right. edgy, and this one was edgy. So um, I hit driver uh, five iron. I remember it well uh, to about 20 feet, dead hole high, right of the hole. Isn't that amazing how golfers can remember specific oh, yeah. that things from? decades ago well your whole career is hanging right here now I, right. I can't really tell you much more about that tournament at all but i remember this one because and this is not in the age of of of, of phones and and where you get instant updates on where mm -hmm. you are you have no idea there's just a a feel about how you're doing and i'm i'm even for the day on a really hard golf course final round of a tour school there's a lot of puking on that day that that's that usually makes up ground so I zip it in there 20 feet, and I feel like I have to have it. And I hit a really good putt. It just went, hit uh, hit a little too firm and hit it about three feet by on the high side. So now I got this left to right breaker three feet, a little uphill, but it's not my favorite putt. And there's a guy, one of the guys I'm playing with who's not going to make it. Ball's right there. I went over to him. I said, bud, look, I don't mean to be rude or anything. But I'm finishing this. I'm not, I'm not going to wait around for the rest of the group because this could mean something. Nobody else was in it, and uh, stood right on his right stood right on his line mm -hmm. to to make that putt. Made it and made it on the number. Did you buy him anything after? Don't remember. Don't remember who it was. <laughs> but God bless him wherever he is. So how, how long did you play the tour? Uh, just a couple of years, 80, 81, a piece of 82. And, and you exited on your annual. So, you know, I was I was off by the middle of the year. Uh, no real threats there. I made a couple of cuts early on. Um, I remember making a cut in Memphis and Milwaukee and a couple of early kind of mid-season. I started in the middle of the season after mm -hmm. that open. And, uh, uh, but our biggest break came, uh, Barry Harwell and I, um, both who, who was from Atlanta as well, I think he went through the same school. Uh, at Pinehurst, hooked up for the uh, Disney World Team Championship, and we shot 33 under for four days. Better and ball lost, yeah, better ball lost to the Edwards brothers, uh, David and Mike. Joel? Was it Mike? Mike? I think it was okay. Mike. Um, and uh, they shot 36 under Ooh. for four days. Uh, we finished second, and we made a nice check, but. That win would have brought a three, four year exemption with it. So that was as close as I got. And that's a big deal. Wins are what change people. Wins. Yeah, confidence factor goes. It's confidence. That's skyrocket. exactly right. That's all it is. And, and uh, it's not talent. Week to week out here, there's 5,000 guys with the same amount of talent. Mm -hmm. There's just confidence. Now, there's that 20% that I mentioned earlier that are better than everybody else. That's true in any sport. Right. I mean, they, you're, you, you, they, you see the, the Jordan Spees and the Justin Thomases. They are they were winning when they were five and ten and fifteen years yeah, old. Prodigies. They I still call win. Them prodigies. And they still and yep. they're destined to be there unless they get hurt. That's about it. That's the only thing that keeps them out. Curtis was probably the best player I saw in college. Andy Bean was playing when I was playing. Mm -hmm. uh, Bean Bean shot nothing. He 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 could he he was like Miller. Um, you know, he'd shoot 60 and 61 and 62s. Um, 
but there were a host. Uh, Jay Haas was was out then, who, who I've I've seen many times since. Uh, he comes through the club here with some regularity and just an absolute gentleman. But uh, th- th- those were um, Coke and and um, Hancock down in Florida. They were Florida had a great team at that point. Uh, so these, um, uh, you know, for me, it was just a function of trying to fit in and, and a win would have done that. And, mm-hmm. and of course, when you win on the tour, you're now not playing with the same guys that you played with in college as a C pairing. You had A, B and C pairing. Well, now you're paired with Nicholas. You're paired with Watson. You're every week you're in the A pairing. Well, you start to think different. You think that's exactly yeah. right, Peter. That's exactly right. You, you go to dinner with them. Mm-hmm. And you watch how they interact with people around the dinner table or in questions and, and or when just in general conversation, you, you sense that confidence. You, you really do. And that's mentorship. That, that's what mentoring is all about to some degree. Right. And most of those guys have brought somebody along with them. You look at the you look at the great players. Um, they almost come in pairs. You had Nicholas and Weisskopf. You had um, uh, Kite and, and Crenshaw. You mm-hmm. see that uh, Phil Mickelson had. Uh, they were at um, ASU with. He was there with uh, his roommate was uh, Johansson Per Ulrich mm-hmm. Johansson. Yeah. Well, they they actually I read a story once. They actually talked about in their room at night. How cool it would be if they were paired against each other in the singles on the final day of a Ryder Cup. And then it happened. And it happened. <laughs> I think it happened at Brookline or it, it, it or Oak Hill or somewhere. I mean, that's stunning. You know, I'm I've got Led Zeppelin flying drinking beers in my room. <laughs> 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 oh god so it, it, it they 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 you brought them along well haas and strange uh, uh you know haas has had had one he's, he's had one of the finest careers of any professional ever mm-hmm. longevity beautiful swing well he watched curtis play i guarantee you he became a better player because he was hanging around curtis who was the ace at that point. So um, I, I, a win like that changes you. And uh, I never got that. I, that. That team championship would have been it, I think. That would have been the break for me. And then I would have at least been unleashed to be as good as I could be. Right. Uh, that, that's the key. We didn't sign for any money back then. You got clubs. I was a Wilson guy. Wilson was was a cool staff back then. I had a lot of good players. And they made those beautiful forged heads and... They'd grind them as you wanted. And yeah, it was always Robert Mandrella was a famous That's right. designer. Exactly right, out of Chicago. Yeah, exactly. And um, uh, so we, we we got some equipment, but we didn't get any money per se. Mm-hmm. You, know, you get your card now. You you can certainly cover your expenses for the year, if not um, a great deal more, depending right. on who you are and how good you are coming out. But um, no, those were big breaks. Uh, but my tour career was was relatively short and. Uh, I often call it euchre esque. You know, they were, <laughs> <laughs> me and euchre have uh, similar. We we pretty much suck, but we got there, and uh, I'm uh, always grateful for that. And then, as I said, as I got, uh, I lost in the. I, I went back to the tour school, uh, f- the first exempt tour in 1982, at uh, TPC. Mm-hmm. Made it through the fi- I made it through the qualifiers, uh, the first stage, and uh, I don't remember if there was two at that point. There could have been two stages uh, to get to the finals, but that was the first school for fifty cards, the exempt tour. I remember Donnie Hammond shot nothing at TPC. For, I think he shot twenty something under. Or yeah, something. he had a he, habit of that. Oof, he was a really good player. I had bumped into him on the mini tours down at, once I turned pro down at the uh, Space Coast tour. Um, and I went there, and I, uh, I TPC was just on a couple of weeks ago. And um, every time I see the 18th hole, I think of my – it was the final hole of my fifth round. I, I, we were playing Woodheads back then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Caught it a little on the toe. Turned it over, this little duck hook that I'm trying to hit anyway. Just caught it a little on the toe, and this thing hits in the middle of the fairway, but it's got all sorts of spin on it and, and rolls and rolls and rolls. And I swear I thought it was going to stop on the boards. That's how slow it was going. I thought it was going to stop on the board, and it just limped over into the mm. lake, rifled something up into the crap right of the green, made triple, put me three off the number needed for the tour for the card that mm-hmm. for the first exempt tour. Shot even the last day. I do remember that, and still finished three off. 
Mm. So never had a chance to, to get back into it again. And, um, um, actually I did go back to the, that same school the following year, uh, in 84, I, I had come to Hilton head then and was working and uh, made it back, won the region in the tour school, but, and so I was obviously still playing well, right. uh, but, um, uh, lost in the finals and then never tried it again after that. What, what was the tour like <clears throat> back then? You know, well, on, on, on kind of a weekly basis, or as much as you play, did, you know, did, did you play weekly, or did you play three weeks in a row, take a week off? Or? Well, no. I remember I was on under Monday qualifyings, uh, so I was under the old system, uh, which was falling apart. You had six, eight, ten spots for one hundred and fifty guys mm-hmm. trying to qualify for on so Monday. So even though you got through the Q school, you, you were not that you, that, you, that did not get you into no, room. no, only eighty and eighty three. Did it start as an exempt? That school in '82 had you in an exempt status, and I, I think that was a huge stepping stone for young guys coming out because it put them pretty much on par with everybody else that was exempt. They could play where they wanted to play, stay home if they didn't like the course, they stayed home. Um, but in my day, you had to go play on Monday to get in the tournament for Thursday. Mm-hmm. So you had almost a couple of cuts. You you had to get in on Monday. You had to make the cut on Thursday. If you made the cut, you were in the following week. So players would parlay that into what was then the top 60. So that, that was kind of their uh, reshuffle system, built-in reshuffle. Sort yeah, of more or less, but a little more a little more free enterprise because you <laughs> you know you had to play you didn't get you know you could you can you can play on a reshuffle play one or two good weeks and then reshuffle into a better position right. now um not the case back then you had to just keep playing if you missed a cut as long as you made cuts you 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 kept rolling but the tour itself was um still at that point you know a big show you know you got you got well taken care of the, you didn't have cars Mm-hmm. But they took you everywhere. There were still sixty, seventy thousand people there. Heck, by the time I'd got, by the time I got there, I was um, I'd never played in front of a hundred people before, and I, I was at Baltus for all playing in front of sixty, seventy thousand people. Different so, experience, isn't oof, it? Oof. Yeah, not comfortable at all. That's not, you know, just. But you do once you're out there, you do grow accustomed to that. Now, Ryder Cup, stuff like that's wholly different. Right. That's a pressure beyond normal pressure. And, and cer- certainly uh, the lead, the pressure with the lead is a lot different than just posting up your, you know, getting, making a cut or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I was able to um, adapt to it fairly quickly. Did that, that wasn't a big deal. For me, really, it was about um, uh, the putter and uh, somewhat of a lack of confidence rather than a, an overly positive uh which that's just your human makeup to some degree right. but the tour itself was a friendly it was it was a it was a it was a cool time I, I think now it's probably a little more segregated with um quote teams of people following these guys around you know they have their own camps if you will that wasn't the case back then yeah there weren't even teachers out there back then that, no, that really didn't start until that better very seldom mid to late 80s very seldom i mean mr nicholas mr palmer would all have these entourages around them they right. were certainly the kings um but um no i don't I, I i don't know that i ever remember seeing teachers per se out there then so mm-hmm. it's certainly changed now it's uh it's 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 far more uh myopic i would say you know for the player uh and probably needs to be uh it, it's gotten more and more difficult there's there's a hundred guys that can shoot 61 on any given day it's amazing out there it? now and uh and i think that's a byproduct of the web tour um they have they have learn to go very deep in order to uh, progress out of that tour onto the big tour. Well, I don't think you lose that that dynamic when you're uh, uh, when you have a good round going. You know, they they they've learned to go low. So just because they're on the tour it doesn't matter. It could be at Palm Springs, could be in Guatemala playing right. and you know whatever um th- th- I, that was the one thing I always had I I I had the capacity to make birdies 
until I just ran out of holes. Mm-hmm. I had course records all over the place. I, I knew how to go deep. And once I got it going, that's that confidence thing. Once I did get it going, I won or I darn near win. And, uh, uh, that, uh, you see virtually in every one of these guys. Now they shoot nothing week in and week out that, that, that web tour has to be 20 on average, 25 to 28 under to win every yeah, week. And I can remember, uh, when, uh, Todd Berenger won and set the record in Dayton, I think he was 23 or four. Yeah. And now, like you said, the guys are doing that almost oh, yeah. weekly. Anderson, the Mark Anderson, the young kid here, uh, who I've I've known and tried to help, didn't have to help him much. He was tremendously talented. He he shot twenty eight under to win uh, BMW a couple of years back mm-hmm. up in Greenville. Um, uh, so the, they, you know, you just you, you, the, these guys. They were the ones, the the Watsons, the the Nicholases. Uh, they were the ones who went uh, deep. They were the ones who had. Uh, the show Lee Trevino was was out when I was playing. Uh, and, and there wasn't a guy when I was playing in the early '80s that wouldn't say he was the finest ball striker out there. Um, uh, and it was a show. You know, if he was around, it was a show. Mm-hmm. Um, not like Tiger or Phil now. It's that's insane what's going on now. But um, uh, nonetheless, it was still a big show. So the tour was was still very electric. You, you you were well taken care of mm-hmm. at that time too not nearly the money by any means by any means and uh, but a lot of my guys played very well for a good long time and tapped into that pension fund which is monstrous huge Dickens. huge um, uh, I forget I think it was John Adams uh, out of Texas hey he stayed out there 20 years you know how good you have to be to stay out there 20 years I mean that's now he I don't know if he ever won but my guy could play. And he was comfortable playing out there, and you know this. But this is it's not a function of talent; it's a function of how comfortable you are. Very much so. In that world, in that universe, to get the most out of your talent. Well, I was never really comfortable. That's all. I, I mean, I, that that doesn't make me good or bad. I just, I eventually you sort of learn to work through that if you have the time. And the biggest problem nowadays with these guys is they don't have a lot of time. They have a year. I mean, they got to produce almost immediately. But um, uh, I think that um, you know the, the comfortability of it, the the ability to um, fight through um, uh, the you know the, for me it was the mostly the putter. If I putted well, I, 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 ha- I had the talent, but just not enough to push me through it. And uh, ultimately, it, it it ended. People used to ask me the difference at that level playing and it, it, like you said it, it's at comfortable because when it comes down to very s- simple decision that should be and if you're second guessing just a bit and you're off just that much that's sure. a difference in maybe making a cut or going sure. home or top tenning or winning or wh- what have and i would always tell people well it's kind of the equivalent of uh driving a car down your street in your neighborhood at 20 and you and you hit a stick or twig and in a formula one race car and you hit a stick or twig yeah. it could be catastrophic yeah. right um, because you're at you're at such a high level and you're you're so well trained and so forth. Uh, there's um, to me there it's it's um, for, I I think the 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 best players just always had a certain focus about them. I saw it in in young Anderson here. Uh, there was a a comfortability a, about themselves in that world, and um, they they're talented, but there there's something extra special there. Mm-hmm. And and for you and I, we had just as much talent. Maybe not the eighty, not in the twenty percent, but we certainly had the talent to fit into the eighty percent. And it just took it just takes something. It does. Kenny Knox was a guy I traveled with a good bit, a, a name that um, a lot of people know if you watch golf in the 80s and 90s. Right. Really good driver of the ball, Kenny was. And we, we, we traveled a good bit. He lost his card not long after. I think we may have gone through the same school. He may have gotten out a bit earlier. He, he lost his card. And a couple of years later, he ended up four spotting in a qualifier, I think, I think it was on the west coast of Florida somewhere, whatever tournament it was. Came out of the four spot and won. Now, and there been many people that have no, done that. That's pretty impressive. That son of a gun didn't miss a cut for like three years. So what happened is all of a sudden the confidence level went up. He's in the A pairings. He's mm-hmm. playing with the Nick. He got to know Mr. Nicholas apparently pretty well. And Jack kind of took him in. 
well, what's that worth? Just, just uh, it goes that goes from uh, how you handle maitre d's and and waiters at at night to how you handle the locker room guys during the day. Just right. watching him, what what did he do? Well, that learning curve is cut way it is. down, and it, and it, and that's the difference between top fifty and thousandth. Yeah, people don't understand that. Mm-hmm. There is such a small difference at that level. It's just a confidence thing. And you know it. You've seen – you've had great rounds. Once it gets going, that confidence there. Those great players think that way all the time. Mm-hmm. Just like great putters always think. They expect they're, they're to make it. it. They expect to make yep. it. That's it. And that's, and that's the difference between a good player like you and I and the guys that went on to what was your money. What was your favorite part? Excuse me, playing the tour back then. Or did you have, was there a favorite part? I think for me it was probably wholly uncomfortable. I, mm-hmm. I, I enjoyed, uh, I sort of enjoyed the travel. Uh, my wife and I, we drove most of it. You know, we'd go to the West Coast and play out on the West Coast. And if you were playing, I never played in L.A. Because it was it, when I was playing, it was the last tournament on the West Coast. And you had to get back east uh, 40 hours or something. And so you skipped one or the other. Right. Well, I wanted to be on Bermuda, not on that grass out west. So um, we just throw it in the car and off we went. And we we enjoyed immensely uh, moving around. Um, I, never, I won a couple of mini tour events. I probably won two or three times on mini tours. The winds were always nice, um, but um, um, I never really threatened outside of that team event um, on any time on the tour itself. So uh, there's, some, there, there's some wonderful contacts that I made that are still alive today mm-hmm. from out there. But um, uh, for the most part, um, I was never completely comfortable out there. And... Um, that's why I didn't last very long. <laughs> what, was there a worst part that there's something you didn't like, or was it all pretty much? No, you know, it was dream? nice. It was cool. Yeah, it was very cool. It's, it's kind of hard to say it was a worst part of playing the PGA Tour. Yeah, well, there was frustrations, obviously, right. and and you you feel the pressure of of needing to play well, and um, I, I I I handled that as as best I could. Uh, but I didn't process things that well. Uh, I, I, I was either really high or really low. If I, if I played well one week, you could book, I'd play well for another week or two. Mm-hmm. And then, it, then it would just kind of ebb the other way. And those were the bad times, you know, those were the, the harder times, but, um, no, I, it, it, those were great memories now, you know, almost 40 years removed now. Yeah. I would agree when, when you're 500 or a thousand miles away from anybody you really know and you're playing bad, it's just like, this is the worst thing ever. It is hard, but I don't think the great players think that way. I really don't. Most people think like you and I do. Mm-hmm. I think these gifted players, these these special people, they think of it just wholly different. Young Anderson, he never knows where the cut is after the first day. And if he shoots 65 or 64 the last day, he will never look and see how much money that round made him. Mm-hmm. I would. He, he's he's a much he's, he's it's a much bigger picture Kucher I, I I got to play with Matt a good bit here for a couple of years uh when he was uh at tech and fixing to turn pro and and actually did turn pro in his first couple of years he was hanging out here a bit and um that guy he, he well first off he's as good a guy as he seems on tv unequivocally it, it just one of the classiest people you'll ever meet but you could sort of sense that his view wasn't what was going to happen next month. You and I had we had to we had to make money, right. or we might not be playing next month. His view was five, ten years down the road. He 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 actually got his card and lost it, and I think he went on the web and won a, couple, a couple of years, times and yeah. came back and then won and, and never yeah, missed and a beat like, again. What's wrong with Matt Kuchar? Yeah, it was one of those things. Well, he, and he, he certainly went through a, a, a swing change. You know, he dropped it right. considerably flatter, and that that seemed to have done the trick. But he knew he was going to make it. He, it just was a matter of time. Mm-hmm. And I, I never knew Curtis very well, but I'm sure he thought the same way. I'm sure Bean thought the same way. You know, Nicholas thought that way. 
Exactly. Um, yeah. And yeah. and you and I were more, you know, that sixty five made me X. That's garbage. Oh, I can play they next week. Never. I'm good for another same. three weeks. <laughs> they would never thought. That. They would have never thought that. I'm I, I'm certain of that. Uh, so it it uh, uh, it is it is a completely different level at that top end. But the majority of them just need a break. The Shoffley kid just stuns me. He yeah. came out of nowhere. And and his swing looks better in the heat than it does on Thursday. He just gets better and better yes, as he's he got gets that, near the that, lead. That quality, whatever it is, that it, it like you said, it, it, the, there's something there. The tighter not, everyone gets, the better he plays. Exactly. It's and like I, a, I, how do you explain that? I don't. I don't. I I, I don't think he was a, a rip snorter in college or coming out. I don't. I mean, he, I'm sure he was probably good. I don't even know where he was from. But I, I remember seeing his name for the first time and was wondering who that was. And then I saw the swing. I said, well, that's a beautiful golf swing. Mm-hmm. But that swing got better as he got into the hunt. Well, that's just a and, – and now he feels like he belongs. Yep. You and I never felt like we belonged. The coochers of the world knew they belonged. Right. That's they had the done difference. It in, the, in the junior golf. That's the difference. Um, so you're still a very good player. You've kept your game up. Um you even qualified in I think two thousand four for the RBC Heritage, which was Yeah. But, at Harbor Town. That was that, a delightful uh, went through a section spot, um, um I think there was just one or two spots. Usually seventy five to hundred players, I tw- guess. Twenty years after you left playing. Twenty playing years. Career. Yeah, I was uh, right at fifty. And um um Nabbed a spot, played a really nice round over at the Wexford Club at Hilton Head, and uh, grabbed one of the section spots. And that was that was difficult, but um, I didn't try to see it as anything other than just a, a wonderful two days. <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't you, you didn't plan to win. You weren't, you weren't beating balls. And, and uh, the <laughs> in fact, I got my dirt balls assistants made up uh, a T-shirt. It's called Harmy's Army. <laughs> and uh, they said Harmon returned. Had a picture of me on the back of the T-shirt, and they had uh, Harmon returns to the tour Thursday and Friday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were funny, but I, I, you know, my I had some family down. I had uh, we I was paired with uh, DJ Trahan and Lucas Glover. Uh, we had Carolina a huge boys. Yeah, all Cl- South, Clemson, Carolina boys. South Carolina boys. Yeah, and uh, had a huge following. I was nervous as can be. I, first hole at Harbor Town is about as wide as this office, and uh, <laughs> and I'm standing up there, and God, uh, you know, it's it's not cool. And my heart is absolutely about to jump out of my chest. And uh, it was a three wood. I just pounded this three wood right down the gut, you know, and uh, it was cool and. By the time I got to the second shot, my heart was racing so much. I told my caddy, I said, it is hard to hit an eight iron with your heart beating 220 mm-hmm. beats a minute. Adrenaline, it's everything. It's just juiced. And uh, I don't remember. I shot 74. So I, I, I'm like a, anytime I get in a tour event, I'm like a rock solid four handicap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to shoot 75 or 76. And, but I've been able to do that. Um, uh, Late my, I never play. I never practice. Um, I will. I guarantee you. I have averaged over the last ten years. I might hit balls three times a year. Might. I, I swing a weighted stick every day. Mm-hmm. That's my thing, and uh, that keeps me loose and keeps. I, I certainly. I have to find my clubs most of the time to go play if somebody <laughs> wants me to play, or I'll whip out my hickory here and, and play my hickory sticks, which I adore. Um, but after a couple of swings, I'll find it, and if it's you know if I check like and cut it well, I'll, I'll shoot my sixty fives and sixty sixes, and uh, so uh, the Lord's blessed me with that. I, I I still enjoy playing the game at sixty five. I don't really play that much, or, or even really care that much to to play I, I like to pick my pretty days like mm-hmm. today a, a 72 degree day and not much wind, light no breezes bugs. and uh I'll, I'll pick them for that but um um i don't I, i'll play a little bit in the mountains where we had uh, for the summer and um um and play with friends and such up there but uh it's like again like i said earlier it's, I, I don't have that burning desire to prove anything to anybody and that's a really nice place to be. Well, it had to be a bit strange where, where 
you know, 20 years removed from the tour. Now you're, you just turned 50 or you were thereabouts, yeah, right? Yeah. And you got all these younger kids and you're playing with them, but so it's not quite your group, right? It's not right. the guys that you knew. But right. then you, uh, what, six years later, 2010, I think you qualify for the British senior. I did. Went over. Um, um, good friend Colin Sinclair was the pro at Carnoustie. And it was the qualifier was there. He said, why don't you come over and qualify? Just one day, you know, wrap it around a trip or whatever. And um, I, I, I went over and uh, qualified. I lost. I, I actually was in a playoff with Gary Hallberg mm-hmm. for one spot, just the two of us. A place called Downfield in Dundee. And um, uh, now I had been, I've been overseas many, many times and um, have um, had... Uh, you know, a tremendous. I probably, I've, I think, I've been to the UK close to eighty times, so I know Lynx golf very well. I hope so. And um, so I was, I, I, I went over, took a shot, and, and he. I think I made bogey on the first playoff hole, so I was first alternate, mm-hmm. uh, but did get in. I was hanging around the, the that day. I, I didn't get in until the day of. I was actually asleep in the bar at Carnoustie when they came <laughs> <laughs> and told me. <laughs> A sleeper, <laughs> not or drinking, out. not drinking, no, no, not drinking. Uh, <laughs> we'll call I, it uh, sleeping. I said, "Come on, let's go!" And uh, uh, literally had about an hour to grab my sticks, and and, and off we went, and um, just peppered that one right off the first hole. My my old friend, the pro there, Colin, uh, gave me a big old smile and uh, turned in one under, lipped it out to go two under, and was on the leaderboard. For a, cool. a millisecond, and uh, then played the backside there, which is the probably the hardest golf and hardest nine holes in golf. That I mean, that, that's such a such a butt kicker, Carnoustie. But um, again, just a great experience. You know, this is this mm-hmm. is what it's about. Um, I was when I was at Harbor Town, my caddy, who uh, Alan Jansen, uh, the old beefy man here. He was uh, he, he caddies for me all the time here. Um, He's just yelling at me the whole time. Focus, focus. focus. He was caddying for you at, at Harbor Town. Oh, at Harbor Town. Did he come, and, come to Britain? No, 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 no. And uh, but at Harbor Town, where I'm going, I'm like, it's taking me forever to get down the fairway because I'll, I'll hit my tee shot and I'll walk over here and say high five. <laughs> you know, some guys over here, and then hang a left and go straight across the other side and high five. And he's yelling at me and yelling at me the whole time around to focus, and and I can't do that. That's that's. In fact, he had a funny line. He said, "You look like the." Uh, governor at the state fair <laughs> <laughs> well I, I don't care okay I, I i don't you're a harder competitor than i am um i i cared about having a good time mm-hmm. that's what it was about if i make the cut that's that's very cool i mean lightning could strike but um I, I, that that couldn't happen same at at, 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 at carnacea i was i was just in one of the oldest championships uh, imaginable, I don't know, since 2010, so what, I was uh, 40, I was 56, something like that. Yeah, there comes a point where, where you have to enjoy the moment. Correct. And you're still trying to Correct. compete. And see, that's consistent with how I've been my whole life. I, I, I cared, instead of on the tour, worrying about making the cut, I cared about uh, enjoying the day. Mm-hmm. So club golf was right for me. I would have been a far better amateur, probably. You know, been been a you know insurance salesman and, and enjoyed enjoy the camaraderie of of a club. But as it turned out, I I morphed into this place, and it opened up that whole world times a hundred uh, on a on a day to day basis. That's what I do, and that's that's why i've been successful is because i cared about did you have a good time yeah well i mean you you found what suited you best yeah and i tell you what you 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 go out to watch a tour event now they don't even talk to one another yeah it's it's almost it's unbelievable it's kind of sad right. really I, i'm sure there's some buddies out there but um i i find that uh, very odd that's a, that's not really in keeping with what i think the 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 real uh, core and ethos of this game is about mm-hmm. it's about camaraderie and a good walk and uh um so it, it's it's kind of sad and in, in one in one vein but uh they also you know 
uh, play 10 years and have 40, 50 million in the bank, too. Yeah, a little different. So then they can be as that jovial and suck can, either. <laughs> can talk as much as they want then. <laughs> So I'm uh, I, I I I just uh, uh, I think I have, the, the good Lord put me right where I needed to be. How, how did you how did you make the decision to say okay I'm not going to play pursue pr- playing professionally anymore? Yeah, hard, very hard. Because um, I, I know when, when I got done playing, I, I I struggled with that very very hard. I, I for the first time in my life I I found out what anxiety was. I think I think I had already begun that transition, Pete, by being at Hilton Head. When I lost my uh, card uh, and missed in the school in '82, uh, Brooke Simmons was the director of golf at, at Palmetto Dunes, mm-hmm. and he let me uh, come down and work carts. Um, so I worked half shifts. I was slapping. You know, I went from signing autographs to taking quarter tips for loading right. guys' clubs on the cart. Harsh reality. Yeah, but you know, I never missed a beat. I, it didn't bother me at all, and I think there's the difference. I, I it was almost a servant mentality of instead of a performance mentality. I was just serving. I was just helping, which eventually led to what I made my livelihood mm-hmm. at, which was serving uh, in this capacity here at this club. Um, I, I it didn't. It, I think I struggled with it a little bit, and I still tried to get it back in in eighty three and eighty four, and 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 failed. And by the time eighty five came around, my mentor uh, um, in the professional side, um, Jim Gunter, I mean, I'm sorry, Tim Moss was um, um, at Moss Creek, and he mm-hmm. brought me over and taught me the club business. And of course, he eventually started this, and then I right. followed him here uh, in in eighty seven. So, um, I uh, I didn't really miss that, and I and I think too, Pete. I think it gets back to the point that I wasn't really all that happy with it anyway. I wasn't. I went to a European tour school during that time. Went over to try to qualify for that. Um, it was just barking up the wrong tree, basically, and and I just finally hit the wall. And, uh, Life said, "No, you're going to go this way." Yeah, it did, and 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 also, I think it. Um, there was there was something of, uh, about the pull of service. I I I just always enjoyed helping people, mm-hmm. and and that's not the mentality of a tour player. No, it's very self centered. No uh, question. When you're there, you're no have, question. you have to be. I think you have to be. I think you, I think there almost is a strain of narcissism amongst the all of the number ones in the world. I think you have this game demands that mm-hmm. out of you. Otherwise, you're going to make a mistake. If there's any questioning, you know, like you said earlier, if you're hung between the the soft seven or the hard eight, and you haven't made that decision. You're going to make a mistake. Yeah, the detrimental mistake. I mean, Nicholas was easily, I think, the smartest player to ever play the game. I mean, I, I think he, his, his, he just thought through everything. I, I didn't. I, I, I didn't, nor, nor, did I, nor do I really think it, it mattered to me in the end. I, I gave it a good run. And, and as I said, I'm extremely fortunate to have gotten there. But these guys, you know, the tide turned, and, and, and Tim bringing me aboard taught me something about the game and, and – that I think, and and you probably hit this as well. I had to, I could not see myself not around the game the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Okay, now it's either playing or in the business. That's you can't you're gonna you can't really do anything else. I guess you could have gotten into it in some other way in broadcasting right. or whatever. But but. In essence, uh, the the great players of the of the early years of the first 150, 200 years were guys. Uh, the club pros were were great players who didn't make it, mm-hmm. and they went into the club job and um, and and then played the games with some competition, certainly to still play in and still hone their skills. But uh, I I was there because I just wanted to be around the game, and and a great club pro I think cares as much about. Uh, Mr. Jones breaking a hundred for the first time, as he does his junior winning the state championship, but winning the state junior. I, I, there's a great club pro is is passionate almost equally in each one. Yeah, and it sounds. I mean, you recognize that, and 
you, you have to have a good upbringing to recognize that too. So, you know, kudos to your folks for not saying you have to do this, you have to do this. Yeah. And, and so I, I think that people not only have to recognize it, but understand it. I don't have to do this if it's not working or, you know, I'm just, I'm not happy. And, and I think I would be happier doing this. How many, you know, you're a teacher. How, how many kids come to you with overbearing parents and the kids oh. in full meltdown? I had the greatest parents in the world. My dad was a great athlete, didn't play golf, but he was a marvelous athlete, tennis, basketball, I played it all. And my mom was was, uh, the one who could handle 100 balls. Mm -hmm. Well, um, they never put pressure on me to do anything at all, ever. I I, I sort of found my way. I, I may have been a little further along in perhaps the tournament side if they had done that, but that was not their, their deal. Uh, they knew I'd find a spot, and uh, not only found a spot, I found one of the sweetest spots on earth. Yeah, exactly. And to this day, my dad, we still have conversations that he said if he wonders if he would have pushed me harder in golf, yeah. if if I would have. I said no because I would have probably probably melted down it or did melt this. You know, like you said, melt down or did something else just out of angst. Well, the I think it's gotten worse. Uh, frankly, in today's world, uh, you hear the term snow plowing or helicopter parents. Mm -hmm. um, you see, you see that uh, I, I, I don't teach that much anyway. So I, and being a national international club, don't really see a lot of juniors. So I, I don't, I haven't done that in a long time, but well, you hear about it mm -hmm. and you talk to any of these coaches at major schools and it's a real problem. Yeah, Conrad Ray and I had that discussion a little bit in his I'm sure. and I'm he, sure. he said that does play a part uh, to some extent in the recruiting process. I'm sure it would have to. Yeah, uh, you just don't chemistry want of to... the team and and everything else. Exactly, you don't need that. You got enough going on. You don't need to be beaten up by a parent. Wonder why, you know, little Johnny didn't play this week. Right. And there's a reason why. Whatever that may be, that's why he's in charge. Um, so I, I was I was incredibly fortunate. And I think it I think it lent to the, this kind of say la vie attitude that i've always had anyway i i there was a i, I just enjoyed having a good time mm -hmm. I, I enjoy a beautiful walk i enjoy a wonderful book i enjoy my dogs i enjoy uh, cooking gardening i hunt i fish i i i like all of that you enjoy life <clears throat> I enjoy life. Yeah, you're not walking down the fairway, not talking to the people you're with. No, I'm giving them a good time, as as a professional should. Um, and um, when they come here, we we don't play golf, uh, but uh, you know this 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 place um, we'll run a hundred through here every day, and then three days later, another hundred come in. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm on A all the time. You know, we'll we'll leave here tonight, go have a couple of wines on the back porch with some of the boys, and <laughs> and then I'll do that again tomorrow. And and uh, uh, but I don't get a chance to go out necessarily and play with them. Uh, but I don't have to do that. Uh, we'll we'll talk about we'll, we'll we'll have coffee. We'll have a dinner. We'll we'll do that. That's what I was geared to do. And it's not easy. It's not easy. Uh, it's it's. And as you get older, it's gotten harder uh, to keep up with it. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a marvelous life. Well, and that's what secession is. But it, it's a great segue to to get into the club and in the history of the club and. You and I, uh, on multiple occasions or many occasions, you've told me some of the history of the club and the hardships in the beginning and so forth. Where most people in the industry or people who look up secession think, oh, wow, it's this unbelievable club in the low country in Beaufort and look at it, it's got everything. But they don't understand how difficult it was in the beginning. Uh, it was very hard. Um, not unlike most businesses, frankly, of any sort, of any scope. Um, it, it, um, it took a while to get going. We had some setbacks. The place was padlocked in 93. There were about five or six of us that hung through, didn't get paid for months on end, probably four, five, six months mm -hmm. before we, we... Did your wife fun. give you the seven iron story? If you don't do something soon, <laughs> no, she's going to beat she's you. <laughs> she's been remarkable all along. Uh, and and this, this business takes... This particular job took an incredible amount of time. Most pros jobs mm -hmm. do anyway, but... Uh, this one took an uh, inordinate amount of time where I have to try. I needed to travel, you know, the, the trips overseas. Um, I was always on the boards uh, with the PGA in the Carolina section. Um, I taught a lot, uh, spoke a lot, and um, never once did she ever say, 
why do you have to go there or why do you have to play in that tournament or mm-hmm. why do you have to go to that board meeting or why do you have to go to Scotland? Um, she understood you. She understood and uh, what it was it. going yeah. to take. And uh, at some point it'll be time to um, stop it and give back to her mm-hmm. um, as we get into our later years. So, uh, But no, there were there were a lot of difficulties. Uh, but uh, And people ask me, why would you fight through this? Um, because it had a chance to be, or has still, a chance to be historic. Not just successful, historic. Mm-hmm. But that was the plan from day one, and it was going to take 100 years to do that. And people say, well, why 100 years? Because it takes that long to get old in this game. <laughs> That's okay? a great way to say you, it. It takes that long to get old. <laughs> <laughs> you, I mean, you might, could, you might could do it at 75 years. I have people that tell me that with the, the, all the internet stuff you you can you can maybe get uh, more recognized sooner i mean shinnecock and and myopia and garden city and and pine valley they sat there for 40 years nobody knew there was there hardly mm-hmm. uh, now that's not the case with with the media uh, and the expansiveness of media you you can find out more um but the the reason i enjoy going to marion the reason I enjoy going to Myopia and, and, and seeing the Taft bunker where President Taft couldn't get out of it mm-hmm. um, is because the Joneses and the Hagans and the Hogans and the, the Nelsons of the world have played there. And well, they haven't played here, okay? But 100 years from now, uh, the Coochers of the world will have right. played here. And that's a historical perspective that I've always had, mainly because I'm a student of history. I've, I, I've studied it my whole life. I have my degree in it. I read nonfiction constantly. That That's a perspective that we had to have in order to make this place work. And the young guy comes in today, and it's perfectly successful, and everything's here. And he, he's, 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 he, it's very easy for him to pull the trigger. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has to understand that. There can be no compromises to that. It is special because of its simplicity. So don't screw it up, okay? Because something historic, well, we're 34 years, 35 years now, um, 65 years from now, it could sit in the same breath with the other national, international golf clubs. And that's what sets it apart. There are a lot of successful places around us, beautiful places, right. but they're not national, international golf clubs. Yes, I think it, it is, has gotten to that level within the golfing industry, but maybe for some people outside the industry might not know as much about secession. Maybe they heard about it or they saw a logo. Um, but for some of those people, could you kind of expand upon how secession differs or, or what the experience is with the caddies and the town and the, and the whole, and the name. Uh, well, we'll yeah. start there. Well, the, the, the whole, the, the name came out of, uh, the secession house. There is a secession house in Buford where we are a beautiful coastal, uh, community or coastal town kind of sandwiched between Savannah and, and Charleston. And, um, the articles of secession were drafted in that house and taken to Charleston. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, ultimately uh, uh, ratified by the, the the state government, and they seceded from the union. Um, it's a it's a controversial word. It's a it's a, it's it's a word that's you know it's given us some 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 exercise from time to time. But all in all, uh, it's it's not that big of a deal. It's a it's been a it's it, we've been wide open uh, races religions. From the day we opened, mm-hmm. and um, I'm proud of that. And uh, we, you know, we, uh, it, it lends itself to certainly more men than any because men you have to live away, and they tend to travel together. And right. couples come in from time to time, and, and and certainly enjoy it as well. And women, we have several women, women members as well. But uh, the the thrust of it is certainly uh, um, more national, and therefore probably more men than 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 not. But um, this was always meant to be a um, intact, meaning no homes, mm-hmm. um, very open links land golf course, uh, very windswept, mandatory walking. We have two carts. We've had two carts for twenty eight years now. And My job, I've change. always joked, is. 
I said, somebody asked me in an interview many years ago, what, what do you see your, your job being over the next 20 years? And I said, well, we talked about the, the walk, mandatory walking and, and the two carts. I think it's my job to make sure we don't have three. <laughs> <laughs> three. That's swear that's it. Just three. No. Um, but you also have a um, uh, um, 100-mile radius. Only 50 people are allowed to live inside the 100-mile radius. Well, that encompasses Savannah, Charleston, Hilton Head, Bluffton. Mm -hmm. So it's not a local club. It's never meant to be a local club. You have 750 national members. So it's a, it's a unique balance to make all of that work, and you can't have a big local populace as well as that large national. So it is truly national in scope. We even have 45, 50 uh, international members, uh, that uh, predominantly from Europe and the UK, but um, uh, this was the plan from day one. Mandatory walking, simple. Um, not about um, freaking, you know, valet parking and sushi at the turn. Right. Okay, that's a byproduct of, of America's prosperity, but not really a byproduct of the history of this game. Mm -hmm. And it's that simplicity, uh, very affordable. It was, it was, it was, that was one of the real tenants as well. It was never a lot of money, and the annual dues are very palatable. Um, uh, that allowed everybody to participate. I think at one point we had five NFL team owners that that were members. Well, we also have guys that are plumbers and tire store owners. Mm -hmm. Could care less. I don't care. They, they they write that check just like the billionaire does. The yeah, billionaire yeah, yeah. doesn't get any benefit out of joining a club that you know cost him a, a, a tenth of what it would cost to buy something in in Long Island. He just wants to be here. And it sets the mood of this place, and it sets the tenor of this place, uh, and it has certainly defined the whole uh, secession experience of just a quiet, simple place to come for a good walk. The golf is extraordinary. The golf course is impeccable condition. And the back porch is becoming legendary. The back porches will be historic yes. quicker than you can make that. That that's that's already in one of the top spots, social spots in the game of golf. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any doubt about that. No, the views, the the uh, camaraderie. Well, and, and, the, and if you think about it, uh, they're here. We, we keep people here. We, we, we can sleep, I think, close to 90 in-house. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we do close to 12,000 bed nights a year on 16,000, 17,000 rounds. That's without any advertising. No advertising. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Leave the light on. Uh, the... Um, What's hap what happens here, and then what makes it so cool, and it's, it's about to happen out there right now, at the end of the day, they've played their 27 or 36 holes, and then they congregate on that back porch. Mm -hmm. There'll be 60, 70, 80 people out there just roaring. Yeah, it's amazing. Because they have nowhere to go. See, that's the key. They don't have to drive home. They don't have to go to the grocery store. They don't have to pick up the dogs or the kids or anything else. They're here. And so they're just having a blast they're just chilled they're just sitting on that back porch enjoying it along with 60 or 70 others and now all of a sudden you, they they start meeting people and you get these giant circles of 15 and 20 people mm -hmm. uh that's the session that is the the that's the, the culture the that you guys have developed exactly. the mantra exactly it's not people will see that logo it's the it's the famed uh, cross flags and they'll 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 come up to you almost smiling with a little smirk on your face. And it's not because the golf is so extraordinary. Like you see, you know, a Pine Valley logo, you know, mm -hmm. that, that is an extraordinary golf course. I'm deserving of number one bit in Augusta. Um, certainly, but they come up to you with a smile on the face because they know you've had a good time. Right. That's the difference. It's about the caddies. It's about the walk, the marshlands, the, the, the porch, the, the bartenders, the locker room attendants, the caddy master. All have been the same for 20, 25 years. That's the mark of a great club. All your old clubs have had a locker room attendants that have been there 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they've, it might be their son that takes it over. He takes it for 50 years. That's the, that's the history of these wonderful clubs, and that's what we try to put into play here. Now, at 34 years, are we um, successful? Yes. Um, I think you could even say we're probably on the mark for where it should be on a 100-year on a I mean metric, mm -hmm. uh, but are we 
deserving of being in the class of those others? No. No. No, it's just t- time. Not yet. It's time. time. You have to go you have time. To pay your dues on the time. Exactly. It's got to get old. And and uh, I've often objected of you can't buy old. <laughs> <laughs> there's people that will spend 150 million on a project uh and and think it should be the, the 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 number one club in the world well that's a lack of a historical perspective mm-hmm. period is it marvelous absolutely you're seeing a lot of them pop up from very wealthy people who kind of build their own places and they, they hire magnificent architects and get great pieces of land and uh they're 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 very cool I think in the end they'll always be a bit cool and sterile. Here, we've and you know, there's a warmth about it. Well, yeah, it. You, you, the, it was built and it it, it was almost a f- baptism by fire, so to speak. Mm-hmm. In, in the early days when you guys struggled for so long, I mean that 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 hardens things and there's you, no you, you get over that hump. And no question. You know, a lot of people maybe don't know the history of Augusta where it was very similar. That, that yes. struggled for a long time. Yes, uh, but that hardens and, and forges the, the club and the membership and the uh, everybody that shares that that they go through that difficult time and that now they have they're more cohesive. And like you said, you have employees for twenty, thirty years. That's right. Um, You're born out of adversity. That's right. To to a degree, and and out of that comes a culture and a, almost an ethos as mm-hmm. to where you want to be and and it's my job as i've sold all the i've sold all the memberships um through the years or or almost all of them um with the young guys coming in today you know they're 28 and 35 and 41 and 42 it's my job as to i don't have to sell them on the place They're, they're ready to write a check anyway it's my job to make sure they understand that that it's I don't care what whether your club has great fire brick pizza ovens, okay, or your chef came from, you know, one of the top culinary schools in Paris. Could care less, mm-hmm. okay. This is this is this is about protecting what through three and a half decades has worked very well. Now keep it for another three and a half decades. Now you're approaching something very special, and. Um, uh, I, that, whether call that you know a, a bit uh, a, a bit self-serving or, or a little too close to the project, is what we intended from day one, and I, I think it is certainly on its way. How do you so? Er, it, it, there's two different challenges that y'all seem to have had. Where you had the early days, it's like, how are we even going to keep the doors open? And like you said, in, in the early '90s, you, they were locked. So how do you get them reopened? So you, you're struggling to just get your feet under you. Yeah. And now after three, almost four decades with the success you've had, now it's, well, how do you manage the success? Well, it's, 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 it's very important um, that when you're in financial straits, you cover the finances, and we did, mm-hmm. uh, thanks to a, a great group of guys who weren't going to let the dream die. Uh, the presidents, that uh, the, the ensuing presidents from those early days uh, weren't going to let it die. And weren't going to let it compromise, be compromised either. Uh, so it's a, a coordinated effort by a lot of people. And um, I, I think uh, now it's, it's uh, I use the term protection a lot. It really is about just keeping it the way it is. I mean, certainly your, your sheets should be of the highest thread count. Your mattresses should be good. Your range balls are good. Your, you know, the towels are good. You don't have to be cheap by any means. But that doesn't mean you, you, you all of a sudden have somebody waiting on you to give you a drink on the driving range. Right. That, 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 that's a quote of elevation that, frankly, uh, is diminishment in the end. Uh, to something very simple and uh, to just not overthink the thing is is very important and and it requires mr ransom uh at pine valley was uh one of the earliest guys here who helped put uh, the charter together uh he, his famous words uh well to me and they've just resonated through the years says one of the finest words in the english language is one of the shortest no <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that, that, we're not actually, going to do that. There's a great story about Seminole. Somebody, some of the members thought they should have breakfast at Seminole. Uh, they only have lunch. Uh, it's been that way for 100 years, or however long the club's been there. Well, no, 
And they just said no. I said you, have, you drive past seven places to get something to eat in the breakfast in the morning on your way to the club. Mm-hmm. Just eat there. No. And and I think when it is it, it, no sets the parameters. I mean, to me, that's what's wrong with our society to some degree. Oh, I would agree. Or these helicopter parents, you know, to the kid, no, okay, no, that's that's a that's a he's Mr. Ransom was spot on. That is a huge word on on in business and society. And we've we've held on, and the presidents that have run this show since the earliest that when we opened in '91 have held to two cards. We've held the the local, we've held to the the the, the um, uh, hundred mile radius of mm-hmm. only people of uh, fifty people. We've we've held to a very palatable dues number and um, initiation number. Those those are the tenets of our success. And if they were compromised in any way, uh, I think you you could have uh, diminishment, perhaps even failure. How, how do you continue for the club to grow? And, and in an ever-changing world with technology and so forth. And how do you know, understand or how do you determine what to incorporate that's, that's changing and might benefit the club versus what you have to say, no, this isn't what we were founded on? You know, how, how do you make that differentiation? I, I think it. I think the member often signals if they if there's whiffs of changing this or changing that. I, I think the 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 membership often steps up and and puts a clamp on it. Uh, uh, you know, valet parking. I've had people tell me we should have stewards to help us with their, your luggage. You know, going upstairs to mm-hmm. the dormy rooms or something like that. Well, uh, no. <laughs> Okay, I mean, there's that word again. <laughs> I do. I mean, and and it's the the more you say it, the simpler things get. I I think it probably fifty years old. So call it another fifteen twenty years. I don't think you'll have to say that. I think it'll be so set in stone. It's in the DNA. It's yeah. In the it just. By then. I had a chance to go up to Long Island and play this past summer. It's, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's a better trip in in the world of golf than. Garden City and Shenny and Maidstone and Friars Head and National. Mm-hmm. Well, National is just spectacular. And, and and I guarantee you it hadn't changed a lick in 60, 70 years. I, 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 I would bet my life on that. Well, at some point, you won't even think about changing it. Whereas a young guy today, you know, a 35 year old said, when we, you know, my club does, you know, has a 15,000 bottle wine cellar or something like that. Well, that's, you know, that's where you can begin to diminish the product by adding expensive, a right. lot of cost to it. You know, I don't, we, we there's plenty enough booze here to get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> You're not lacking in that category. <laughs> ah, and so the it, it's that now we have wonderful wines. We have six or seven selections of wines, and you can pay two, three hundred dollars a bottle for it if you want. Mm-hmm. And that's that we have that. But that's where you get caught up. And and again, I said earlier, that's the prosperity of America. That we've we've been blessed immeasurably here. Right. And and but out of that has grown something other than golf. And so our focus has always been golf. Period. That's Keep that's what brings you back, and the the testaments to that are overseas for the most part. There are some. There's certainly some here: San Francisco Golf, um, uh, Myopia, Garden City, Shinny. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're, all these old ones have been. Uh, you know, uh, uh, went to Fisher's Island um, a couple of years back. God, it's magnificent. The Chicago Golf Club. I mean, they, those are the testaments here. But even here, there they get somewhat posh Prestwick Muirfield I mean, those are two of the finest names you can mention overseas that's as simple as it gets great lunch um, coat and tie have to be buttoned up to, to, to have a drink in the bar mm-hmm. or to have lunch uh, aside from that that's it. There's 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 nothing more sweeping. I, I told the story the other day about Prestwick, and I, I it was two years ago. I was there, and I was showing some some of our our, our members the the lockers there. They went in 1860, start of the Civil War. These lockers went in. <laughs> I'm showing this little row. They call it death row because they the older members get them, and then they kick, you know, and they mm-hmm. replace them with a, a live member. And I'm I'm showing them <laughs> this. I'm showing them this locker, and I and I open it up, and the whole locker face came off in my hand. 
I said, oh my God, I've broken it. I, I let them look inside real quick and see how unique and mm-hmm. you know handcrafted they are. Very cool. And I put this locker back into place and set it down in kind of the holes or whatever and shut it, and it stays. Somewhere on the golf course that day, it hit me that I bet you that locker's been that way for 50 years. At least. Yeah. He didn't care. It works. He knows how to work it. That's all that matters. Well, in the States, we'd be yelling and screaming at some maintenance guy that club's going to hell in a handbasket because his locker's Mm -hmm. loose or something. They don't care about that stuff. They care about a good, fast walk. They love foursomes, which is... A, you know, a pretty cool game. I'm, I have to admit, I, it took me a long time to evolve into it because we want to play our own game. But I mean, if you want to get on with it, it's it's it's. You know, we, I can play in Prestwick. I was there there two years ago. I played in two fifteen, two twenty, eighteen holes. Wow! And, and then sit down for four hours and have lunch. You know, four hundred bottles of wine or something. But then go back out and do it again mm-hmm. uh, in two fifteen, two twenty. Uh, they just don't care about the periphery stuff and 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 here we have and i and i think to the to a large part to the diminishment of the game i don't i don't want to go to a club where anything you want you can get that's not golf no that's something else you you got you you and uh bob walton and tim moss i mean you guys set the vision and you set the standard very high for the things that people would appreciate the most and that you knew you could deliver on Yep. And that would stand the test of time, and that's exactly what's happening to the club. They always use the word um, understated elegance. Yes, two great words. There's an understated simplicity and elegance about this place. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think you see that at Augusta when you go there on a day-to-day basis, not during the tournament. It's it's just a beautifully simple place. Now, it's a, obviously a very complex place, uh, when it's all said and done, but uh, to be there on, on, on a day when there's not that much play, and uh, you sit on that back porch and 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 uh, with the, with the oaks behind the clubhouse and the sun setting out that way with a cocktail, mm-hmm. uh, uh, very reminiscent of just sitting out here. Those big sweeping verandas and porches, you know, very views. southern feel yep. about it all. And uh, Tim and Bob uh, had the vision, as did the fifty original founders. These these founders put down a chunk of money for, for literally uh, 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 an island in the middle of a swamp. We used to take them around in boats to show them the <laughs> land, <laughs> and we'd drive them out to Seventeen Green and me. two. <laughs> yeah, a couple of them got stuck. I wasn't on that. I got, they ran up on a on a. Uh, a little patch of ground and, and got stuck and had to wait till tide to, uh, came back in to mm-hmm. to get out of there um yeah it took a it took a it took a long range um sophisticated high golf iq guy to buy into that and and there's a wonderful line uh the I think it's called the Marigold Hotel movies. There were two of them, the exotic Marigold Hotels. There's a cool story about the lady who had this hotel, and they ultimately are being bought by a by a, a big corporation. And the owner of the, the CEO of that corporation comes to see the lady, and she says, "Why in the world would you travel all the way to India, which was where this hotel was, just to to sit and and talk?" And he said, and I'm paraphrasing to some degree. I always enjoy sitting with people who plant trees, but who will never sit under them. Hmm. So basically, we've started something that I'll not see at its peak. I'll do Tim nor Bob nor any of the original founders. Heavens, the the thirty year old today may not even see that uh, in 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 his lifetime but his kids will. And that's that long range view that every one of these people had. Uh, and, uh, I was, I was given the, the honor and the opportunity to help fight for that. And, uh, as a result, it's the biggest honor of my life. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, amazing place for anyone that hasn't ever been here. Um, mm-hmm. they need to find somebody who can help them get here. And experience it at least once. It should be on everybody's yeah, bucket yeah, list. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's one something I want to get into that not a whole lot of people know about, and it's something that you started. Uh, it's the mentoring program. 
that you, that you all do with with local kids. Um, can you yeah. t- t- tell a little bit about that? Yes, um, I actually did that uh, when I was at Moss Creek. Um, started working with a couple of really good juniors and uh, arranged through the club to to give them sort of carte blanche at mm-hmm. the club um, to hit balls, um, access to the golf course. It, was a little harder to do there with the two kids that I started with, one of which is the head professional here today, Jason Hildreth. I, he was one of my first juniors. Still with you. Still with me. I think he's been here 22, 23 years himself now. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, once we got to Beaufort and, and the course opened in 91, uh, I wanted to keep it, um, um, keep, always keep an eye out for a great young player or two mm-hmm. and, and give them that opportunity to um, – uh, to make them as good as we could, as they could possibly be, and uh, that was a junior program. We kind of call it the Junior Academy program, and basically, we we hear about these kids uh, through various professionals and and amateur association uh, execs. Uh, uh, here's a good kid. You need to take a look at this kid, and uh, we interview the parents. We make sure that their grades are good, mm-hmm. uh, and they 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 are fully made aware of the fact that if they fail in their studies, B's is what we expect, a B average, um, uh, they have full, full privileges here. Now, we'll, they make, I make them come in and um, uh, check in with either the caddy master or, or the pro shop. Uh, it could be nothing more than taking out the garbage. It could be uh, washing off one of the two carts. Uh, <laughs> it could be punching woods on the range, whatever, clearing off the chipping green. And for that, they then have full privileges. And then they get pulled in. We like them in the 13-14 range. Um, I've had some some really good kids that we really missed that we should have gotten earlier and uh, probably could have played college golf if we gotten them earlier. Uh, mm-hmm. We got them at 16 and 17, but it was a little too late. Uh, so that 13-14 window is, is what we look for. Mark Anderson came along in that. He was 13 when he first surfaced here. And... Um, they they so not only do they get access to the golf course but now they've got access to all the professionals on staff who help them with their game mm-hmm. uh we help them with all of their equipment uh i've been a titleist leader uh leadership committee uh, or board member for gosh 25 30 years something like that titleist helps tremendously in helping to get clubs in these kids hands that but these kids are good they're, they're shooting even or I mean, they're shooting casual high school rounds or practice rounds and around even mm-hmm. at 12 13 14 years old so we're we're targeting the really good player in the community of buford uh hilton head has their own guys over there but we do the we do it here and it has been a marvelous program there's probably I, I don't know if there's two dozen that have come through that, but there's quite a few. Now, what also happens is we get them in their equipment. They begin to play. I get to sit with them. What are you playing in this summer? I.e., kind of like what I should have been doing when I was putzing around playing baseball or right, selling Right, so you, you, you basically clubs. taken something that you didn't have and made sure that did not affect kids in your local community the same Bingo. way. Bingo. And that's that that was something I wanted to do from day one. And of course, the staff's always, uh, you know, jumped on board uh, completely with that. But I um, uh, by the time they're 16 and 17, they can start to caddy and we'll use them as a single caddy. Let's say there's a three ball out there. A regular caddy doesn't really want a, a, a three ball because he's making less money. We can right. use him on the four balls. So we'll take one of these kids on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday and uh, when they're out of school um, and, and put them to work. You know, all of a sudden they're making 100 bucks for a single bag loop. That's a lot of money for a 15, 16-year-old. That's for sure. Um, and so uh, right now we have four or five young kids, which is the most we've ever had. All but one are 14 and under. We've got the number one 14-year-old in the state here now. That's great. Well, he just came aboard a year ago, and uh, we just got him fitted a year ago with Titleist, and now I look forward to seeing him explode this spring and, and summer. Um, but those are the those are the thing, and then of course they they are able to put a little money in their pocket. But then um, the nine eleven fund, uh, the Levine Roach fund, uh, we lost two guys on nine eleven. Uh, that scholarship program, which is totally endowed by membership only there's no outside money in this one uh we're handing out 140 150 thousand dollars a year to local kids these young kids in the academy program are now tapping into that scholarship program as well 
So we really can impact some lives very nicely with that. Maximum awards ten grand, but at the end of four years to have forty thousand less, right? And yeah. charges and debt or whatever. That's and it's very a way special. the club gives back to the community. I mean, no you really help, and it's not no just doubt. the playing and the privileges and the clubs and, the, but the, the the members here at the club that they meet, whether they pursue golf or not. You know that they have contacts in the business world and absolutely uh, avenues through, through and, but like you said, they have to maintain their grades. They have to yep. show up on time. Do their you know work. Do they have their to job. submit their paperwork on time. Here's you know here's the, teaching them responsibility, teaching and, them to get it in. And we've had to make some very hard decisions on kids who failed to get their. They may have been on it for two years, mm-hmm. and then the deadline is I think right around the first of March. Uh, they're a day late. No. No, that is a hard lesson, but it's it, one that I bet the kids who didn't do it will not ever forget. They won't forget it, right. and the, and 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 I think they'll that'll carry on the, for the for probably the remainder of their professional. Life. I would not be surprised that fifteen years, twenty years, whatever, one of the an adult walks in here and you, they introduce themselves and they say, you know, Mister Harmon, you taught me a lesson when I was a kid, and it and it. It helped me do this in my career, and now I'm very successful and so forth. And you won't even know who they are until they no. tell you their name. All because we said that word again. Yes. Uh, those are the boundaries. Those are the parameters. Those are That's the structure that's, that's required for a successful individual. And um, a lot of times the parents will, you know, piss and moan about that. And, uh, uh, you know, we don't care. Uh, it, it is about teaching them responsibility Mm -hmm. and uh, we're willing to help them and they have to we're not asking for a whole lot but we are asking for some accountability uh so uh these young kids now in this program now have gone from 13 who knows where they're playing they've all we've had two state junior champions anderson won the state amateur um and has played on the tour three, four times over the last four, five, six years. Um, I don't doubt that there'll be more uh, in, in the years to come. It wouldn't matter. I could care less whether they played or not. We just They're good kids, and we're helping them. And if they go on to play great, a lot of them feel some pressure that they have to play well. And, and I, I speak with them regularly about that. That's not what this is about at all. You're here because you're a good kid, and you love the game, and you can play a little bit. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll just see how good we can make you very special it's very well special to me that's what i needed i needed somebody to grab me my my coach uh jim gunter he grabbed me and brought me off the streets into a driving range but he had no experience of having played the tour or having played at the highest levels i'll sit down and talk to these kids aren't you need to be playing in the north south this year can you get that are you going to play in the state amateur you're going to play in the u.s open uh, u.s amateur qualifier you know you're 14 15 years old give it a shot who knows right. i mean you, you never know you know Let's if, if, he, if you he gets through it's an experience of a lifetime um that's that's stacking it up to make them as good as they can possibly be and then they they uh they go on whether they're playing college golf or not doesn't really matter to us they go i i don't doubt uh, the guy that runs our accommodations came out of the caddy ranks and the the 9-11 fund uh, to come back and handle 12,000 bed nights a year for us that's awesome all the i mean he, he's one of the top employees at the club so it we, we've seen this thing come full circle or i've had a chance to see it come full circle just because i've been here so long <laughs> that it, it's, it's you know it's it's uh it's just delightful to see and these and and right now i'm really juiced by the fact that there's four or five great young players in the city Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a small town for the most part, but there are four or five really good players, and I've met with them. We've met with the parents. Uh, uh, they're they're over the moon about this, and uh, uh, this has been a, a real joy for me. And we we talked earlier before we went on, Mike was about uh, my play my my own assistants and and players. I'm I'm always looking for the player. Mm-hmm whether he's the amateur or whether he's going to be working here because that I I can teach a kid how to do anything in this business budgets teaching rules merchandising we won the national merchandiser of the year award with the PGA out of the shops 400 square feet or 450 square feet I think it's the smallest shop to ever win that maybe maybe Pine Valley I think Pine Valley may have done that they're smaller than we are um 
I'll bring, you know, I can teach a kid anything in this business. I can't teach him how to shoot 66. That's instant, that's, that, that's immediate uh, uh, respect from the member. Immediate. And, and that cannot be replaced. That opens up doors for lessons. That opens up doors to go play in pro-ams, travel the world. I've traveled the world right. because I was here, but also I got this job because I could play. Tim and Bob thought the same way, and I have carried that with me all along. Um, I, I've been barking at the PGA for a long time that there, those playing standards need to be lower because we can teach. Sure, you're going to turn away good kids. I don't... I don't care if that kid can't break eighty. It, what his chances of of moving up in this game are fairly slim. He could be the nicest guy on earth, and he could run a club. But what kind of respect does he have amongst the membership if he can't beat half of the membership? Even if they're not going to say it. Yeah, I mean, you're right. a good player. You you you've earned your respect as a player. And um, I, I I when I go to hire a kid, I'll have somebody call me and say, "Pro got a good kid. I heard you had an opening." It's well, can he play? He's you know seventy five probably on casual days. No, no, I, I want the kid that can win the South Carolina Open. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we've we've got a litany of championship trophies around here from assistants through the years that have won state opens and Carolinas opens and and um, national qualifyings and and such. Um, uh, because I, for me, it is it speaks volumes about the club, and it speaks volumes about my staff when I put them out there to play in them. Uh, just a, a game, fill in for a for a, uh, with a three ball, and uh, they shoot sixty five. Yeah, or they're traveling and they're wearing the Secession logo, Bingo. which is probably as recognizable around the globe as any logo That's in true. golf. That is true. That is true. So it is. Uh, it, it, just like the juniors, I'm still looking for those same kids in the in the um, uh, in in my golf shop as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've been very fortunate to. To have had uh, a ton of great kids, many, well over a dozen, dozen, probably close to 15 or 20 now, I guess, that have gone on to their own head professional jobs. Right. And um, and, and just make me proud. We had the pro member back in February, and God, I think there were eight or nine that were back um, with like a members from the. Uh, it was marvelous. Pretty cool. And, uh, we had a, a terrific time, and I'm proud of all of them. They've, they've just, they, they, they represent the club, they've represented me wonderfully through mm-hmm. the years and uh I, I look forward to their many successes a lot of them have already won awards unto themselves you know, the merchandise on the tradition. And, and yeah they they you know they they've been involved with education one of them's going to be chris bird's going to be the president of the carolinas uh section next year mm-hmm. so uh it's neat to see again that's the position from age uh, that that allows you to to see that and and see it come full circle but uh, I think we 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 as an association, the PGA, have missed that to some degree. They they lost sight of the importance of being able to play the game well, mm-hmm. and uh, hopefully they'll get that back. Before we get into the kind of the last part, I I want it the uh, the cannon in front of the clubhouse. Yes, that's a very unique thing that you guys do with that. Right, and I, I love the stories. He, you you can obviously tell it much better than I can. Can you just explain the story of the cannon and what it represents and means and the the battle that goes into who gets to point it where? Yeah, uh, this uh, goes back as an honor to Dick Deal, uh, who, in my opinion, was the savior of this place. Mm-hmm. He put it all together in that 93-94 era, eventually built a clubhouse, and uh, as an honor to him, three members bought this Napoleon cannon and functioning cannon and um we we fire it at uh every event uh the the champion from the year before comes back into town as the defending champion and gets to fire it before the the tournament dinner that's a blue gray tournament that's all of them all the club events okay um so um the the captains for the blue and the gray that uh, the, the gray tends to dominate the blue um in the in the blue gray i think we've played 20 five or 30 of those things now and um southern boys 
put a ass kicking on the north. I think it's like 25 to 5 or something like that. I think, I, I think the only reason is because the southern boys are still fighting the war. You know, the, the north won. They don't, they don't care. They just come down and have a good time. Uh, but uh, the captain, the winning captain, fires it the following year. But uh, the, the the member guests, the, the pro members, the, the winners fire it the following year. I can assure you they think about it a lot during the course of the year. Uh, it points, um, uh, based on the blue-gray outcome, it points, and so with that many southern victories, it tends to point north, where the south's firing on the north. So, so that, just so that I, I know it, but some people that might not know it, that the the blue gray is the northern members are a team, and the south and the gray Correct. is the southern members are a team. Correct. And you have a Correct. A, about a week, 120, 110 to 120 week, all members tournament, yeah. like a yeah. match, like a Ryder Cup style. All right, they play. Um, Better ball on Thursday, practice rounds Tuesday and Wednesday. Some will come in on Saturday. You know, this, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them come in and don't even play. They just sit on the porch. Um, I think a lot of them <laughs> circle that week in their calendar every they year. They do. They yeah. do. And um, they uh, we play better ball on Thursday, alternate shot on Friday. We, we've maintained that mm-hmm. tradition. And then singles on Saturday. Uh, and it usually split pretty well. We're, we we used to be heavily northern in the early years, but as the as the notoriety of the club's grown, we've picked up more in the south. So it's not far from fifty fifty as far as north right. and and south. And uh, so the the that will rob some of the boys from the north uh, uh, that uh, may own property in the south if we need some southern boys. <laughs> but they've always accused us of you know stealing the good players and putting them on there, which is BS. But uh, uh, we had um, uh, they they uh, they'll they'll come in and they'll, they'll play and uh, and then whoever wins, you you point the cannon from the south to the north let's say or if the north winds it points south during the years well in the early years there was and this thing's loud it'll blow up i think it blows a four or five pound ball about a mile <laughs> mile and a half something like a minute it, it, it works uh and um we pointed it uh from the south to the north and uh, i remember the evening well it uh it was a real foggy evening it was a full tide so we blow this thing off before dinner, and I'm sitting in there having uh, uh, dinner with the boys. And uh, um, uh, 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 one of the waiters came over to me and said, "Bro, the, there's a policeman out front." <laughs> I said, "All right." So I'd had a couple glasses of wine. I was had a smile on my face. I walk outside. And I said, "Hey, how you doing? I'm Mike Harmon. I'm the the golf pro here." And I'll never forget this guy's name. His name's Hello, Mr. Harmon. My name is Deputy Fripp. He said, and we got to do something about your cannon. <laughs> I said, Deputy Fripp, tell me the truth. Now, I was tuned up. I said, tell me the truth. Have you ever said that in your career? <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't expecting that. Uh, what we did when we blew the cannon, there's a house about a mile away. We blew two pictures off the walls oh and about 20 books onto the floor. The dog went nuts. <laughs> the guy called the police. And uh, so we had a good time with that. They did a sound testing uh, the next week. I mean, there's F-35s and F-18s flying over this guy's house. <laughs> I mean, it didn't even register compared to those things. So, no, it was. A, but to, to I think the guy's name is Freeman, actually. Uh, uh, as a, in honor of Mr. Freeman, we fire it south all the time now instead of north, and then turn it. You know when it's all said and done. So uh, yeah, it's pointing north again for the hundredth time or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, That's uh, awesome. Yeah, it, but it's a uh, it's loud and it never gets old. Just a little toy, you know. It's a, people. It's so funny. If you, it depends on how much of a charge you put in it. I, we usually fire it at about a third of a charge, but if. Uh, Bert Carter's the the irrigation tech here. He's been here 25 years plus, and mm-hmm. he handles all the cannon firings. And uh, he'll slip a, half a load in there every <laughs> now and then, and <laughs> you can always tell it too, because when you fire, you know you got 100 people out on the front porch, and they <laughs> blow it off, and you roar, and then they all pile in for dinner. And you walk in, you walk out there afterwards, you'll see about 20 wine spills, you know. <laughs> where they it's a lot louder than you think it's going to be they spill wine all over the place but um a great tradition and 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 a worthy honor to uh mr deal it's called the real deal mm-hmm. 
and uh, he he was the savior of the place. I mean, we had to fight it out. He was president for eleven years, and um, saw it through some really bleak times, and then saw the roar of the the nineties, the late nineties, uh, and uh, he built the the clubhouse and uh, never lo- really looked back after that. I remember when you guys were in the caddy caddy shack. Oh, yeah. When the clubhouse was a caddy shack, I Absolutely. still have the flag, the the frame flag I bought the first time I came here. I think in ninety four, ninety five. Yeah. This around. opened in ninety six. Yeah. We were five years in that caddy shack. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and 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 again, like we said earlier, it was it was uh, it was still fine. There was nobody here. We were playing three four thousand rounds a year. It was it was very empty. Got a lot of reading um, in. Golf course was yeah, <laughs> you know, you, golf course was um, uh, still very immature in a lot of ways. It's been mm-hmm. modified a little bit by Mr. Devlin's. This is Bruce Devlin's baby, no doubt about it. This was his. This is easily his best work, and uh, very uh, deserving of the kudos that it's gotten uh, based on his work. What was the controversy, or, or for lack of a better term, about the fourteenth? Is it the fourteenth hole and, and the green? Yeah, the, 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 that goes back to the dies. The dies were originally scheduled to do this, and Pete got jammed up with Kiowa. And um, uh, we had, um, had some issues, and I was here during that, but um, it um, ended up with them leaving, and they searched around and had uh, picked Bruce. Mm-hmm. And uh, easily one of the finest gentlemen i've met in this game he's just an outstanding guy world-class player he's done a couple hundred golf courses around the world he almost won augusta a couple of times he i forget how many times he'd won worldwide but it's a chunk I mean, he was he's a marvelous player but just a outstanding guy uh, a lot of fun to be around and um he he took this one over in its rough shape mode and uh finished it off and um has um just it just done a, a a tremendous job with it and uh i um i couldn't be happier for him i think he's he just turned 80 and uh still kicking we have a um a devlin cup um it's an invitational um scratch better ball uh, that we play late may early june in his honor and uh uh just um um you know he just did a great job at he and dick and all those original founders, um, you look back on this and, and you just you just marvel at uh, where it is today. But uh, uh, the, the, the honor of, of, of having Bruce's name on a tournament and having the cannon in Mr. Deal's name is mm-hmm. very special. And, and that's what great clubs do. You know, they, they have these traditions. They have these honors. And, and they uh, keep them. And they keep them. I, I, I remember having lunch in Sunningdale with the... Uh, the captain and uh on a trip many years ago and we had lunch in the in the in the awards room i mean there wasn't a square inch of that room that didn't have uh a name and a date associated to it tournament boards club championship boards Mm -hmm. there were breaks you know when you travel overseas you and in the u.s to some degree you see breaks for world war one and world war two (laughs) <laughs> Sunningdale had a break for the Boer War. It's like eighteen ninety five or something like that. I mean, it just, it just, it's, it's the, and again, that's old. See, that's old. And our boards are beginning to get long. Mm-hmm. You know, our boards will. You know, the 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 we had it's a gold, a paint, a uh, gold um, um, uh, lettering that that goes on, and uh, the, you know now you know within another few years we'll have to have another board. That's old. That's a good problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been we've been just uh, the, the we, we have so many traditions. The chip off the back porch is another one, where we decide our tournaments. You just hit off a doormat if it's tight, you know, and go to the 18th <laughs> green. Uh, we used to do a play playoff around the loop on 16, 17, 18. Well, everybody's gone by the time it's done. So now we settle it in the backyard, right in the back, and then people just roar. You just if it's tied, it goes to the it's a little chip off of the porch. You get two balls off the doormat, you know, mm-hmm. and and uh, uh, it's been held probably five, six times into the to I mean, to, to a roar that you just can't believe. Uh, uh, they they haul it out and the place just goes nuts. So those are traditions that um, linger and uh, hopefully and, and I'm sure they will be carried on. Yeah, to good purpose. Yeah, yeah. Let's move. Uh, 
in a today's game. So your career, <clears throat> I don't want to date you to anybody that doesn't know you, but let's just say it's, it's spanned <laughs> the modern era. Um, you've seen everything from woods to metal to titanium, um, wound balls. I wouldn't say you were good at Percha era. <laughs> <laughs> to, to today's yeah, you look good in this coke pr- pr- <laughs> <laughs> prodigious length but in all that you've seen with all the technology and so forth what, what do you see as good and then what do you see as bad i don't i don't um i don't like seeing the the ball go 400 yards um but in sport, that's almost inevitable to some degree. There's right. there's reasons why high jumpers jump higher, and uh, mainly because they're bigger. Uh, the you're 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 a teacher. I'm I don't teach much, but um, you, you get a kid that's six four and has a forty inch arm. He's gonna hit it further than me Big at at five eleven and a thirty two inch arm. I don't care how much. Now, what's amazing to me, and we see a lot of college kids come through here. I see a lot of small kids generating a ton of club head speed. Mm-hmm. So uh, they've learned to hit their ball hard. Uh, the now that gets back to the equipment again because you can miss clubs in today's era and still somewhat get away with it. Somewhat, um, obviously, a three hundred and fifty yard driver is going to be markedly more offline than a 250 yard uh, on, right. on this on the same block right or the hook but um I, you, you look at a guy like Kepka or dj um i mean they're just specimens special athletes i they're mean they're, they're real athletes, athletes. They're, they're athletes they could have probably played in the nfl mm-hmm. or they could have been at wimbledon you know they, they, they it's just whatever they had had chosen to do um, so uh, I, I don't know that there's volumes you can do about that. It, isn't it remarkable how the great classic old courses, even with all of the bombers in the world, almost invariably still produce a eight or a seven under score, winning right. score. And they can build it 9,000 yards long if they want, and they'll still shoot 22 under par. They'll find a way. It's, it's the competitive athletic nature of a, of a top-level world-class athlete. But the, like uh, Ridgewood up in, in New Jersey, they host the RBC there about every two or three years. Classic, classic golf course, like a Baltus Raw, but but they don't set it up in an open type of uh, setting. I mean, it, it, it you know, five, six, seven under wins. Even Harbortown tends to hold itself up well. Yeah, uh, it's one of the shortest courses in, on the tour. Exactly. Right? It's always around... 10 to 12 under. I yeah, think. it holds its head up. Uh, so um, I think that may be a little more about design than than uh, it is about the equipment. I, 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 but I do think um, you know, the, the, the kid's ability to hit their ball just prodigious distances is probably somewhat of a problem. But I, I'd, I don't know that they know how to play shots as much. They, they know how to flight their ball. Mm-hmm. Uh, they know how to hit the ball straight, and they know how to hit a half, a three-quarter, and a full, and I know how to hit it at at seventy five percent flight, fifty percent flight, and twenty five. They they know how to do that. Uh, but back in the old days, when we had softballs and forged heads, say if uh, you know the the Ken Venturi's of the world would tell you to cut the six into the back right and hook the seven into the back left. Mm-hmm. You know, you moved your ball based on the shot that was in front of you. And guys like Nicholas, they, they would do that and never oh, – there's a great story about Nicholas. We had this discussion the other day. In 72 holes at Augusta, he never crossed the line with an iron shot, meaning he hit a left or right shot, mm-hmm. and it never went right – it never landed right of the stick in 72 holes. That's insane. That's amazing. I mean, that is just insane control. I don't see that necessarily today. Um, I, I, I think they have shots, but uh, the equipment, the ball doesn't move as much. Uh, the the perimeter weighting um, allows them to sort of get away with miss mm-hmm. hits. And there's a there's there's there is an advantage to um, a guy like DJ to just pound the bejeebies out of it. And if it, it's just, if it ends up 95 yards short of the green. He's going to have a great look at birdie. If he misses at 50 yards offline, more or less, he's probably able to make par. Now, that's more design than it is, right. frankly. I would agree. Uh, why the Open Championships with the grass up to your knees, you know, allows for an even par winning score. Mm-hmm. Um, I played Shinnecock this past year, uh, not for the first time, but... What a what a stunning place that is. I mean, that 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 might be the best golf course in the country. 
you can argue Oakmont, you can argue Cypress, Pine Valley, and, and Augusta, each in, unto their own. Marion, I adore Marion. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but th- these are, um, it, it, when you grow it up to your knees, that's a whole different animal. And um, but week in week out, these these TPC courses that have been designed to host two hundred thousand people or something like that, they're big, they're long, and they, they seem to think the longer they make it, the 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 the, the tougher they'll make it. That doesn't ever seem to be the case. No, not at all. They just keep hitting it further and further. So um, I don't I don't I don't see the shot making of Elite Trevino. I, you know, I, I, I never was around Trevino. I don't think we ever met. But I guarantee you, when he sees a guy. With a one-shot lead, playing the 72nd hole on a good golf course. And this guy literally just has to drive it in the fairway, and he's going to win the golf tournament. And he can't. Must He must just fall off the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was a piece of work anyway. But you can just hear that because they didn't miss. They didn't miss those. They had a shot that got their ball in play. Mm-hmm. They, they found just they, they they found the fairway. That was all, and um, it's it's annoying to me to see how many fairways these guys miss. Um, we saw that in the Ryder Cup um, over uh, in France. You know they weren't able to drive their ball in play, and um, the Europeans did, and that was pretty much the difference. They right. had the rough up to their knees and. You had to gouge out, and you pretty much had a bogey on your court. So um, uh, I, I, that's, I think, the biggest thing. But these, the, like we said earlier, they, they come out shooting nothing. They're not afraid to shoot 61 or 58 or something. They don't, they don't balk at that. That wasn't the case when I was playing. Uh, the Andy Beans and the Johnny Millers of the world shot nothing. Norman, I thought Norman pretty much revolutionized the game to a large degree himself. Mm-hmm. I mean, he would call a number. It was remarkable. I mean, he had the second longest run of number one in the world uh, behind Tiger. Right. Um, he had, you know, he, he they'd interview him. You, you can you can just see him sitting in the booth with Nance and such, and they'd say, well, uh, what do you think? I said, well, I, I think if I shoot 62 tomorrow, I have a chance. I think 61 wins. I don't and know. He was 60. Serious. He was dead serious, and he often did it. And it was right a lot of times. So I, I, to me, he and, and Miller sort of pressed – the 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 gauge that has now set you up to the point where these guys just expect to shoot nothing every time they play. Right. Uh, so it, it has changed, but it's the most splendid game in the world, and it's the most diabolical game in the world. So um, in the end, I remember an old caddy, uh, a Scottish caddy said something to me many years ago and I've never forgotten. He said said, Pro, just remember one thing. The game always wins. <laughs> it's like the house. <laughs> the win like the house, right. The game always wins. And that's exactly right. They 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 and and these guys, I think they they're the Kepkas and the bombers of the world, they they'll just take their shots. And if it works that week, fine. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Right. That they'll just take their shots, and they, you know they'll try to drive it down on number two at Harbor Town, around the corner where they have a seven iron in, mm-hmm. where they could hit three wood, four iron on, or three or wood, nine, three iron. They're going to go at number nine. Or number nine, take a shot at it. And if they, if, if all of it, if it's their week, then it works. And if it, and if it doesn't work, they just head to the next site and do right. it again. Uh, I, I did. I don't. I think there was more shot making in in the older days um but um again you know the great golf courses uh, still hold their own we're only a couple of weeks away from augusta that baby holds its own there's Pretty no good. doubt now they've made it longer uh to adapt to that but it's those green complexes that make them so diabolical mm-hmm. and uh so it that old girl still stands up beautifully uh but uh no i i think i think and and of course agronomy has gotten far better but the, when I played the tour, those, green, those, those courses didn't suck. I mean, they were they were good. They right. were they were in fine shape. Um, but uh, you know, you, you played places like the BC Open at Enjoy. Well, it was as wide as this room. I mean, it was narrow and had some pretty good rough on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had to thread your ball around. These guys would get lost playing there. They just probably wouldn't play there. It just uh, so we we had to kind of. Um, we had to make shots. You know, the great players. I was never a cutter of the ball. I was sling hook this sucker out there. And, you know, 
<laughs> I love that. And, and, and that was the that was the glaring omission in my game, I think, was the fact that I couldn't hold something against the wind. I could drive, I could hit it with a little cut. So if I needed it in the fairway, mm-hmm. I, I hit that little baby cut. And uh, um, now I, I don't know that there's that much shot making per se involved with it. There's there's far there's just more touch and in, and in, in with regards to flighting. Tiger was the best flighter of the ball ever in my book. Mm-hmm. He taught a whole generation how to play the game, and uh, oof, he was and, and he was. I, I was I'm so happy I got to see him play. I know he had his issues. I don't care less. I'm, I, he's not my he's not my spiritual guide. Okay, he's, <laughs> I'm just there to watch him play golf. And and I know I sat around clubs for for 30 years and 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 40 years watching the pros and the old pros. Uh, whenever he was on those old pros, whew, right to the TV. Yeah, they wanted to see him play. He'd sit in there and hit a three quarter. Ha, you know, three quarter, fifty percent low, seven iron, burn it in, and right to left, land at fifteen feet, right of the stick, and suck it to the hole to five feet, and then turn around the next hole and hit some high carving four iron in there. Mesmerizing, absolutely mesmerizing. So, uh, I got, I didn't get to see Nicholas really. Uh, he was pretty. He obviously he still won in eighty six. He was still playing at, at Augusta. He won in eighty at the at the Baltus Open. Raw, I played yeah. at Baltus right. Raw. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and and he was certainly playing well. But I didn't grow up watching him play um, uh, per se. I, I and and nor was there a lot of TV. Frankly, we didn't, you know, you'd see a couple hours on a Saturday and a Sunday. Mm-hmm. That's about it. Now you see them, you know, wash their car in the morning before they go to the freaking golf course. Amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Next to the gym. That's a problem for me. I, I, I get so tired of listening to the dialogue day after day after day. I'm just beating a dead horse. I mean, I, I, turn yeah, the that thing seems on to be it. the thing in, in all sports that they analyze it to death Jeez. before and after it's like oh Jesus. well you know and i guess i don't mind that so much what what bothers me is that they actually think they know what's going to happen I mean, this is the greatest game in the world they can't tell squat of what's going to happen you can have an opinion at least just say well i think this this might happen about as accurate Not, as weatherman <laughs> yeah, exactly that drives me nuts uh so i i i, I don't listen to, to to much of it i i think it's a um there's a lot of good people in that business, and they and they know, and and a lot of the players um, have have uh, stepped in and and done a great job. And for, you know, the consummate professionals like Nance, those are you know those are mm-hmm. those are very special people, um, and uh, you know the the all, all the players that have joined them through the years. I know they get a kick out of it, uh, but um, God, you know, just I'm a big English soccer fan. And it just drives me nuts listening to commentators tell me what's going to happen in a soccer game. Well, you can't tell me anything. You can have an opinion on it. Mm-hmm. But a soccer game, you know, get a lucky goal, get a penalty in the box, all of a sudden the, the underdog's down one, they park the bus in front of the goal, they win one to nothing. When the, the, the super commentator thinks that, that uh, you know Chelsea should win by three. Right. No. you got to play the game. Mm-hmm. And they, they seem to lose sight of that sometimes. But, uh eh a job i guess but it's a uh uh i love the i love the 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 com- the um uh, cameras the camera work mm-hmm. watching it nowadays is incredibly special i mean as a teacher you must love that you know these oh, the these shot super, tracer in particular the shot tracer is huge that's a big ad i don't know who started that was it fox i don't remember i don't think but... it was one of the majors i think it was i think it may have been fox uh, that that's just revolutionary uh, to me because I I adore seeing what they're doing with the ball. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, uh, it's a cool it's a cool time. Um, um, and and of course we've we've got Augusta around the corner. I'm a George Atlanta boy, and oof, there's nothing like that week. It's the greatest week it's of the year. Special week, isn't it? Oh, it's the best week of the year. I just see that. I just I hear the commercial music. I'm just. Yeah, you know, just like Pavlov's like, dog. Yeah, just that, that music. <laughs> the, 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 uh, they show the azaleas and such. Oh, baby, nothing like that. So I look forward to it. And and they've, uh, I know they've made uh, quite a few changes. And uh, again, as they always do, it's mm-hmm. kind of like Muirfield. I think Muirfield in in uh, Dublin is uh, the one Mr. Dickless did was is easily one of the top five modern golf courses uh, of post nineteen 
60. Yeah, Mod, very modern, place. modern edge. Well, uh, modern age. He, he, it's not only pretty, but it through the years they've modified it because they're the best players in the world playing it. Mm-hmm. Well, Augusta's done the same thing, and they've learned, you know, what to do here and what to do there, and uh, they just turned it into a, an absolute treasure. I've had a chance to play it four or five times, and um, mm, and uh, it in St Andrews. That's the you know. I'd, have, I'd be hard pressed to figure out if I only had one round to yeah, play. Yeah, flip a quarter. Which for that one, one that would be? Yeah, I'd be hard pressed to pick that one. So, let, let I want to get into. The, let, let, I'll stick to. There's so many facets of golf, right? And hence, when I came up with the name Golf 360, there's so many things to talk about right. in this game. But well, I'll stick with your air expertise as far as what you've been doing for the last 30 plus years, almost 40 years, the, the club side. So, if if you were King Mike of the PGA of America, um. What would you change within the club side of the industry? Oof, that's a heck of a question. Well, we mentioned earlier about the um, playing. I'd, I'd have that um, um, playing mark uh, to, to for a playing ability test. I'd have that thing at probably 144, mm-hmm. 146. Like I said, I can teach a good player the business. I can't teach a good business kid how to shoot 66. Right. I, I would. I would change that. Um, I would. I. I have often thought there's too many assistants for each club. I think they allot two per nine. Right. I would agree. I'd probably like to see that half. Um, I can find nice people to work in the shop to to ring things up or answer the phones. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think if you were to cut that in half. Um, I would, um, I, I think the young kids coming along, we could take better care of them at the club level and pay because you're paying less people, less people, right? You're paying the same number of people. You don't have to pay them the, the, the local person to help you in the shop nearly as much perhaps. And so you give them a little more of a earning wage, which is hard to do, um, these days with um at the assistant level but we all paid that price and and uh um but but when the time comes for them to go look for a job instead of having 400 applications you may only have to beat out 100 you know or 200 or if there's 75 you only have to beat out 35 i I think Mm -hmm. you i think you're going to get um the same quality at, at at each of the club levels, but I don't think there'll be as many. I don't think there'll be more uh, of an advantage and an opportunity for the the uh, um, uh, for the young pros. Um, uh, Seth Waugh uh, is is now the president, CEO, whatever his title is for the PGA. Seth was a member here for many years. Wonderful, wonderful guy. And one of the first things I heard him talk about was a pension. Now, that would be interesting. I have no pension. You know, guys have been, there's probably been at clubs 40 and 50 years with no pension. They had to put their own money away. Right. Um, and there's a lot of money that the PGA makes um, between the championship and the Ryder Cup. Um, I know that number, and that's a substantial number. I would love to see him do that. I think, I don't care if it's 500 bucks a month. I could care less. I, I think what's important is a guy spends 40 years of his life in this business. Um, I can make a very, I can have a nice car on that payment right. in retirement. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I, I think they, they, I think they have a ways to go. They, they, uh, and, and I, I don't think they can, I haven't talked to Seth since he, since he got the job, but uh uh, he he, you couldn't ask for a finer person there. So um, I, I wish him luck, and hopefully they'll they'll continue to to um, um, uh, help the the plight of the the club pro. Who I, I am absolutely astonished at how badly so many great club professionals at great clubs leave their jobs. Yeah, it, it's, you you get a, a job at some of these clubs, and you should be there for life. Without a doubt, I mean, it, it with the history of the club as we talked about earlier, you, you, it makes you wonder. Well, why are they not? Why are they leaving? I I, I can discount. I, we had this conversation today on the back porch. I, I 
I, I, I can I can rip off six or eight people right now that just left badly at the end of a long career, and these are the hallmarks of the of of, of club golf in America. Um, a lot of them do it right. They they do, and 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 God bless them. Um, so maybe they can figure that one out. I don't know. Uh, it's 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 not um, it's not. Uh, uh, the end of the world. They've, you know, we've, 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 we've gotten through it. But um, uh, I think you have, um, you know, a terrific guy in the leadership role. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I, you know, they continue to to grow the game um, to some degree. You and I've talked about this before. Where I, there's limits to it because it's so expensive. Right. It's an expensive game. It's it's just not something that can matriculate down to the mid to lower class economic classes because it's expensive it's time consuming as well and it's time consuming now i have always said that the um in 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 the 18 or in 1830 and 1840 when you were at saint andrews it took about the same time to walk from downtown saint andrews out to the eden river and back as it does today (laughs) <laughs> okay, so <laughs> all right, it didn't shorten through through uh, two centuries, um, and I, a feathery was as much as a workman's monthly wage, a feathery ball. So it was always time consuming, and it was always expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that um, the PGA and the USGA hoped that they and perhaps tiger was the pied piper to some degree for this that they would be able to get this into some of the mid lower classes and and they certainly made a great effort not and they brought a lot of people to the game i don't know that there's i don't i don't see the facts on that but um hopefully they brought uh, a few more into the game um but you i don't care where you are you're gonna have to have a budget of a half million or so between maintenance and somebody to run the operation, if it's three, four people and you got a couple hundred, you got three hundred thousand to, 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 to for operation, and that's not a really good golf course, you know, maintenance wise, and uh, another hundred thousand or so to run the show, that's absolute bare bones. Mm-hmm. Um, well, when you have something like that, you can't charge a hundred dollar green fees. So the income's not the income it's very difficult. Yeah, the the, the maintenance budget uh, eventually parallels what you can charge, and and so it's just it, it costs a lot of money. It costs a million dollars or so to run an operation on a fairly small scale, and um, so you end up pricing yourself out of it to some degree for the mid to low. Uh, economic levels so it's very hard and uh, that's why we do what we do we, you know the kids we the look at are, are, are ones who um, don't have perhaps a lot of options and uh, uh, now we can help them uh, if everybody did that if every club did that I think we'd probably help a lot more people mm-hmm. and then ultimately they they uh, figure out whether they play the game or just uh, you know in college or uh, professionally and or just play the game for the rest of their lives either way we're the beneficiaries yeah they're, they're the, the you're setting the foundation and then they're building upon that but you yeah. guys are helping instill that and i and i i i, I just uh, uh, there has to be some way to work I, I've 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 often talked I did an interview not too long ago and we talked about park golf where the developers over the last 20 years built golf courses the game didn't need so it watered down everything they were they the, the developer didn't care whether the golf operation worked all he cared about was selling the property around the golf course the golf view That's well right. if 50 people or 100 people went there and they left another place that watered down the other place and that that can't work in the new community either so a lot of these people a lot of these places have um a a, a golf course supposedly or what used to be a golf course in their backyard on a real estate project now their real estate's deflated because there's not a golf course back there which is what they bought on Mm -hmm. and um you you've got open space that can't be deemed to be anything other than a golf course or a common area if you will and that's where i talked to a guy once about park golf where you just cut everything at the same height, greens, fairways, uh, tees, everything. I mean, there's a gang mower, just pull behind. You just mm-hmm. cut the grass. For the greens, you just let it grow, put a stake in the ground, 
um, you know, big piece of PVC, six inch PVC, paint it black and white, plop it down in the middle of the green. Now you and I go play. We both hit it to 150. I hit it uh, 20 feet. You hit it 10 feet. I chip, not putt, it's no cup. I chip, try to hit the pole. I miss. You chip, hit the pole. You've made three. I've made four. We are playing golf. Now that dates back to the early days of golf in the 1700s or so where they played in the parks where you and I would just play across a huge park and hit Mr. Jones's fence post. That's how we used to play as kids. We, Absolutely. We hit a tree. Up, yeah, we tape up wiffle balls so they'd go further, Correct. plug up the holes. Correct. And then you, you, the first one to hit the base of the tree. For it hit a tree, hit a, you know, whatever it may and be. And we'd pick nine trees around the yard, and that Correct. was our nine-hole golf course. Well, the, the theory behind the park golf would be that the community sort of gets behind it. So if you had a property on that golf course, you cut your yard to the fairway line mm -hmm. the the now you could run that operation for probably a hundred thousand you could probably get the pga to back some of these projects that could be your first t program a dad could take his kid out there and play for 10 and five bucks or something yeah you know? it, every it, put it, money it, through it the door in to the game it does and the community begins to thrive a little bit because not only is it a golf course but if you want to go play a baseball game out there I mean, how many times did we were we playing baseball on the street and we just had to move aside mm -hmm. to let a car through? Okay, <laughs> right. well, it's kind of the same. It's a park. That's why I call Kids it. Kids don't care. Golf. They just want to play. Just want to play. But you know as well as I do that that kid who's playing with his dad, who's chipping to try to hit this post, and sees the boys on TV playing. Eventually, he's going to want to go somewhere else to play. Mm -hmm. Well, you could run that operation on probably a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, and make it work and clean up a neighborhood. Well, I, I spoke to a few people about that. <laughs> <laughs> Where does it happen? <laughs> I mean, you would absolutely think I was from freaking Mars. Okay. They didn't get that at all. Uh, a couple here, one upstate. Uh, talked to the PGA about it, uh, somebody in the office. Yeah, I gave that up. Mm. I still think it would work. I, st I still think there's, there's probably a perfect scenario for that somewhere. That's no different, really, outside of the green complexes than what you see in the little nine-hole villages, uh, the, the villages in Scotland that have, in Ireland, that have a little nine-holer, and the community takes care of it. Yeah, you I get think one guy that take, cuts a green, or this is the artisan society that you, you hear about over there, where the, you know, there'll be 20 or 30 guys that are part of the artisan's club at a particular club, have them at some of the finest clubs in the in the world, Liverpool, uh, St. Hans, uh, Litham. Um where there's a group of guys who are given playing rights, limited playing rights for filling sand and raking bunker, filling divots mm -hmm. and such. Well, you know, boil it down a little further, and, and, and there's the little nine-hole community up in the northern part of Scotland that a handful of guys take care of the golf course. There may be one greenskeeper, and he probably collects your money as well when you play. Very simple, but, God, yeah, I gave up on that one. I'll let somebody else yeah, fight that shot. war. You never know. Don't get yeah, but yeah, I'd love to see. I'd love to see it happen one day. I really would. I'd love to see what would happen. I'd love to see the PGA actually fund some of that. I mean, with the kids coming out of school, you got a clubhouse probably that's sitting there. You can put the kid in the clubhouse. Mm -hmm. They don't live there. Give him a truck. Pay him fifty grand a year. Now he's got a place to live and a a truck. Just and fifty thousand. He's not spending a thousand on rent and five hundred on anything. exactly. You know? He he actually nets out better. Right. But that's a. That was a stretch. Let me ask you about your not the, your mentoring assistant program, not the mentoring program you have for local kids, but you, you've mentored uh, a lot of assistants here, and we touched on it briefly before, but they always go on to do some very, very nice and great things. Um, what's your secret sauce, so to speak, I mean, outside of being a good player? Because I mean, you, you get these guys who are good players, but you still develop them. Um, turn them into where they're going to, to, to some very good clubs and then winning awards? Well, I, I get, I, I'm, I'm fortunate as are the, the, the great clubs and there are so many wonderful professionals in this country who do the same thing. Um, I can think of Brendan Walsh at uh, Brookline, uh, Scotty Nymeri and Bobby Ford at uh, Seminole. Um, there, there's just so many great pros that represent great places. Mm -hmm. And because we represent these wonderful places, people, young professionals, want them on that resume. So, so we do get, to a large degree, the cream of the crop 
and um and, and they know also by coming here that more than likely, as long as they behave and, and do a good job, uh, they're going to get a good job. They're, right. going to, they're going to get a job. Now, it may not be their end job, but they are going to get a job. I have a lot of young guys come to work for us that um, may only be 22, 23 years old. Well, they have another move in their future, and that's where I help them as well. So if I have a kid let's say, who, who's 22 or 23 right out of school, who may work here three or four years, five years, he's 27, let's say. Mm-hmm. Well, he's got another move. Where, and then that's where I ask them, where do they want to go? If you're from the Midwest, do you want to go to the Midwest? Do you want to go to Florida? Where do you, where, do you want to stay in the Carolinas? Do you, do you want to go to the Northeast? It could be a New York boy. It could be a, 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 a Maine boy. Do you want to go back home? Well, based on what they tell me, then my job is to make sure they get a great job. Well, obviously do a good job here so right. that I can recommend them. But uh, ultimately, um, if they want to end up in uh, into the Northeast, I will help get them into the Northeast at the second stage of their assistant career so that by the time they're 32, 33, they've worked a couple of good places. They're good players, may have won a state title. And now they're working at, a, at one of the top clubs in the Northeast. And now when a job opens up and he's won the Met Open or whatever, boom, mm-hmm. he's in the he's door. In. And uh, uh, so we, we, we take this very seriously. Uh, this, is, this is my job as a mentor, as a proper professional. And we, we, we teach them the ins and outs of every element of this, of this operation. I own the shop here. They see how much money I make. I show them everything. Because I want them to know how you make money out of a shop. Real problem with guys, and you don't see many people that own their shops now. No, uh, that's pretty all. much uh, uh, bygone days. But um, I, I, I show them how, uh, in a free enterprise system, you make money in this particular setting. Mm-hmm. They see all of my numbers. I get them involved with the payables. Get them involved with the buy. And then as we're going through the seasons, we're paying off hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in, in invoices. And then there's taxes, and then there's insurance, and there's expenses, and there's commissions. I pay commissions, and club professionals that own their shop should be paying their assistants commissions. I'll say that to you boys right now. They should be paying something. Uh, they're the one selling for you. Right. Uh, so they're at the end staff. of it, they're your sales staff. Uh, so at the end of it, there's X. There's just X left over. Mm-hmm. There it is. And, and if I buy right and we sell correctly to a certain pro forma and pattern that we use to, to buy, which I show them, uh, then there should be X left over. And they see that. And um, uh, uh, that's just, uh, just good basic um, sense when it comes to uh, capitalism and free enterprise. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they leave here armed, I think, ready to go. Obviously, we have a tremendous reach with the national international club, so we can generally get these kids um, in, right into the area they want to go. But I, once they're with us a couple of years, I often talk about it, uh, not always in the interview, but where do you want to go? Also, do you want to be in a resort? Do you want to be in private? Do you want to be in daily fee? There's a lot of freedom in resort and daily fee. You, know, you get some jerk in there, you can kick him out. Right. You call the police, just take him out. Can't do that to a member. Nope. So um, there's a lot of politics. I can teach them the political angle. I can teach them the, 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 the budgeting. I can teach them the teaching side of it. Um, but as I said, I can't teach them how to score. And that's the instant respect amongst mm-hmm. the membership. And uh, uh, so we've been blessed to, to have tons of great kids. And I, as I said earlier, I'm so proud of all of them. They've done, they've done a, a terrific job and, and represent not only uh, me but the club uh, beautifully. So uh, we, we, we but, but this is, I think it has to be at the forefront of, of the, the head professional or the director's golf job to make sure that these kids are moving in the right direction. And um, a lot of them don't care. I've always said that uh, on both fronts that, it is the responsibility of the, of the head professional, director of golf, whatever title they hold. Right. It's easy to become complacent. It's also easy. It's easier for the the assistant, who's usually younger, to become very complacent. And as the mentor, the the elder statesman, etc., that it's one of their primary responsibilities to make sure number one, the kid doesn't get complacent, and to teach them 
what they're going to need at the next level. Prepare them for that. Well, and if they if they, if if that kid's too complacent, then you've hired poorly. Mm-hmm. And no doubt about that. Uh, and 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 we've all made some some poor hire, hires through the years. But I've been very fortunate there. We've had wonderful kids come through, and and I, I sure that. Um, um, most of the boys I mentioned earlier would say the same thing. We were blessed to represent um, marvelous places, and that makes you know that that's that makes it much easier to draft the kids um, into this, knowing full well that within short order their career should move on, assuming right. they do you know everything that they do. And, and we make them work with um, outside agencies, um, juniors. Um, Boys and girls clubs, um, uh, local juniors, um, um, clinics, and such like that. So, um, uh, but by the time they leave here, they're they're depending on how old they are. They're either ready for their own job, or they're ready to move into that second position. Very um, well rounded as their assistant, and 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 in the area, uh, the geographic area they want to live in. What uh, so if there's an assistant out there that wants to be the next Mike Harmon, what what in today's world of PJ professionals in the industry what do you see as some of the challenges for them well there's a lot of a lot of people applying for an opening mm-hmm. so you you're going to have to stand out somehow some way um i i still contend playing is is probably the most important um your personal skills uh your dress if i've been a if I have a, a a sin, it's certainly clothing. <laughs> <laughs> I love good clothing and uh, adore wearing good clothing. And um, uh, so you have to to look the part. Um, um, you know, I'm not too keen on beards. You know, if you're, you know, your whole club's a bunch of deer hunters. You know, I guess that works. Mm-hmm. But um, for the most part, I like a, a, a clean shaven kid. Um, the, um, um, the, there's, you, you, you have to, in some way, make yourself stand out. I was fortunate as a, a former PGA tour player that got me in the door. And then I had the skill sets to, to figure it all out. Um, I certainly, um, had a, a mental aptitude to handle what was in front of me. Mm-hmm. Uh, with this one, this was a limited partnership. I had to have my series seven and series 11, uh, securities license in order to sell this. I had to go study oil deals and cattle <laughs> futures. <laughs> Wild. That was, that was crazy. Some of the hats. That, that was the, crazy. The golf pros wear a lot of hats, but not too many of them had to wear that hat. <laughs> it really pissed me off. I, you, you, said, you, you take the test on a computer, and uh, it's just standardized testing. You can go back over it, and I'm going all over the answers on cattle and oil and all this. And you got to make 70. I'm looking at it, and I'm... Just push a button. <laughs> Boom. Push the button. 69. God, that pissed me off. That pissed me. But I, but I, I blew it. I think I made 82 next time through. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, but you, 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 you just have to be prepared to handle. And I, and I think still, and we touched on it earlier, you have to have the heart of a servant. You have to want to help people day in day out and if you don't have that then this may not be the best business for you because it could be you know a very long torturous process <laughs> <laughs> i don't I, yeah, I, I i think that gets to the heart of it as i said these great professionals that i've known they they care they care about they care about the the 20 handicapper as much as the plus two mm-hmm. and uh, they can go out with a 20 handicapper and give them just as good a time playing as they will challenge the plus two handicapper. And uh, uh, that's a golf professional. And well, yeah, there's that 20%, like you talked about players, There's, I would say there's a 20% that just have that ability. You you have that ability. It's, you fit so well in, 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 in the environment you're in. You you, you, you match extremely well in, in that category. I, I, maybe so. I don't know. I, I, I don't know that I can speak to that. There are... 25,000, 30,000 golf professionals in, in the U.S. And, mm-hmm. and they probably, every one of them do a, gra- a cracking job, you know, every day and, and, and deal with all the same crap that everybody else deals with. The, the you know, Mr. Jones uh, lost, his, we, the, the, he lost his head cover that he got from St. Andrews on his, you know, 20 years ago. Or, and, and, you know, how do you handle that? How do you, how do you tell a member that he's slow? 
Very hard. Right. Very. You better have some skill sets, um, uh, you know, or worse, you're cheating. Comes up. How are you going to handle that? Uh, you do it wrong, I can assure you that within two or three years, the cocktail circuit will have been poisoned to the point that you're out the door. Right. Uh, it's, 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 you, you better have some skill sets and those are, those are really personal skills. I, I look, I look for a guy who laughs. I want I want, I want our guys to have a good time. Now that's not always the case at um, a, a club that's a little more buttoned down than, and that's okay. That doesn't make them any better or any worse. It's just knowing what you're, you know, what you're up against. My, my stick's not going to work at a lot of places. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a big hugger. I laugh. I high five. I sit around and joke with them. We, I, I stand at tournaments and just tell them, you suck. Okay. You're, <laughs> at, you're at the bottom. You suck. But, but I do that in, in a way that everyone seems to laugh a little bit. And, um, that's kind of what I've done. It's kind of laughed a lot. And, uh, so I look for those guys. I want them around, uh, and um, think I can. I certainly know I can help them mm-hmm. in, in their career, and and perhaps help them in a in a monumental way. So uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a great part of the business. As we get closer to the end, let, let me read off this list here, and I I think I got them all, but you correct me if I'm wrong. So CPGA Carolina's PGA Merchandise of the Year 2000-2004. Carolina's PGA Horton Smith Award, 2003. National PGA Merchandiser of the Year, 2004. It was a busy year in 2004. <laughs> Tour event, Merchandiser of the Year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll go on. Carolina's PGA Bill Strasbaugh Award, 2005. National Bill Strasbaugh Award, 2006. Carolina's Professional of the Year, 2007. The Carolina's PGA Hall of Fame, 2011. You played the PGA Tour. Your wonderful husband and wonderful father. You're the director of golf at Secession. Am I missing anything? <laughs> no, it's it's uh, the the but the the biggest honor still is was having my a bit of a fingerprint on this one, mm-hmm. this club. I mean, those are those are wonderful honors, and they were wonderful evenings, and we got to share a lot of of time together. I'm you know having played at the highest level and. Having won, you know, tons of tournaments uh, in the section and um, uh, and uh, enjoyed so much um, uh, the, the 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 honor of putting something potentially historic into play. Mm-hmm. This was what I enjoyed the most. Um, the, the I adore the National Merchandiser of the Year Award in '04. Uh, still wear that ring um, uh, as the the first big award uh and of course i was a close horse and that that meant a lot Mm -hmm. to me as well but um um i i I, i've often said i i I got to do the two things i enjoy the most i'm i'm a golf professional and i own a men's store and um to me that is always fun i've been a, a polo advisory board member for 20 plus years um always been a Ralph Lauren guy and I um, adore the clothing I, I, I get from them and uh, uh, so the, the whole clothing side of that I love sitting down and buying uh, still like touching fabric still still have all my pants made when I go uh, to the Dominican Republic in the winter and mm-hmm. play in a tournament and go into town and touch the cloth just go into this market and just touch the cloth funny story came out of that one uh, two years ago, I'm down there with my caddy Antonio, and he takes me into town, and we go to the market and pick the cloth. I usually have six or seven pants made, and I drop them off at the tailor. And I always take him out to dinner and tend to go to the same spot all the time. <laughs> this is really sick, but I, I can't, I, you know, it's, it, it's hilarious. It says a lot about me. And uh, we're at this place, and we're having a couple of beers. We're going to have dinner, and we're sitting at the table and he's got some buddies kind of to his right on this little upper level in this restaurant. And all of a sudden four or five gunshots ring out and they're close. They're five or 50 feet away. And, uh, I, I look quickly to Antonio and he's on the floor (laughs) 
and his buddies in a millisecond are on the floor. So the time it takes me to move my eye from him to the front door is half of a second, just a blink of an eye. And everybody in the restaurant is on the floor. Except you. I'm sitting there in a beautiful pair of white linens <laughs> holding a, a El Presidente. The first thing in my head is there's no way I'm hitting the floor in these pants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a sick individual. That is so bad. Well, I mean, I guess I, I ended up kind of squatting down. Didn't even ever take the beer out of my hand. I just sat there with the, the kind of semi in a baseball catcher's crouch or something, <laughs> you know, with my, my El Presidente in the hand. Never, no way I was hitting the floor in these beauties, you know. <laughs> Not unlike what I'm wearing today. But it, um, the clothing side is it was was has always been very special to me, and we've made a, a, a real go of the shop. I love the fact that it's so small, uh, at 400, 450 square feet. It's it's it um, cozy. It, it and it cranks, and and with the logo and and uh, the experience everybody has, they they certainly come through the door wanting right. uh, something uh, from the from the stay. With, with, with the list of awards, what I want to ask you is, with all you've achieved, it's a what gets you out of bed in the morning? In other words, what keeps you motivated? And, uh, and, and, on, and, and on top of that, I guess I'll throw three questions at you at once. Is, well, I kind of know the answer to this. It's known you so long. Is how do you stay humble? So how, how do you stay motivated? And how do you stay humble with, with such a litany of awards? Well, this is, a, this is a wonderful place to come to every day because it's fresh every day. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have uh, 75 to 100 people roll in here for three or four days and we go way way back and um, uh, they're in we'll have a coffee we'll have a dinner we'll if I can sneak out for a few holes I'll go throw them on the shoulder and walk a few holes with them um, so it's always fresh uh, that that's a real plus uh, unlike the, the the pro at the home club who sees basically the same people every mm -hmm. day um, but I, I'm a man of faith I, I, my faith means everything to me. And um, the word says God's tender mercies are renewed every day. And, and, and I always get up. I have a daughter who's, who's uh, bipolar um, to the downside of depression. And she can't get up. And um, it's hard. It's hard to see. Um, so... Uh, my wife's been very ill for a long time. Uh, I, I've seen the other side of it, and, and, and I, uh, I never fail to get up. I never fail to um, go out and, and enjoy a day. And, and uh, I don't know that without my faith I would have gotten out of bed. But with it, I get out uh, mm -hmm. every day and, and face the challenges that hit us uh, as a family and that hit me once I walked through the door. Now, this is not, I'm not working in some uh, coal mine, you know, right? Uh, you know, or stamping out cans in some factory. It's a marvelous place to be. But my time gets consumed quickly. Um, all these people want uh, to stop in and say hello and ask about my family and ask how I'm doing. I had some challenges last year. I had cancer last year. I had to beat off. And, uh, uh, then I want to know about them and their kids and their grandkids who I've become close friends with. And uh, so everybody wants to stop in and just sit in these same chairs you're in and chat in a, in a great environment. I love this office. And uh, uh, however, there's not enough 10 or 15 minutes in a day to get all that done and still handle all the sales for the memberships, uh, mm -hmm. run the golf operation and run a business my shop which is the, the the largest part of my income so it's uh there's a lot but uh i just uh, rejoice in 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 my faith and, and in the lord and his grace and i i seem to uh put it all together and uh, one day will not one day i'll walk away uh and we'll walk away um of uh, unequivocally I, i'm not gonna just hang around you know if uh, when the time comes for me to get to my family and really spend the time that's necessary to, 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 to do what I need to do for them, um, it will be unequivocal. I'll, uh, we've got a beautiful little place up in the mountains of North Carolina. That's where we'll go. Mm -hmm. Beach Mountain, 5,500 feet. That's gorgeous. And uh, we love it so. And, um, 
and that'll be a sad day. That's that that, but I'm reconciling myself to that with each passing year, mm-hmm. and um, uh, one day that's going to come, and and I can uh, not have the hundred balls here that 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 surface every day. Um, but um, I know there's just, there's just not a, a more blessed man on the the face of the earth. So it does make it easy to get out of bed. What uh, what would you want, or what would you like your legacy to be? Oh, that um, I served my fellow man in all capacities, not just here. Um, compassionate, giving, a sportsman. I'm a sportsman. Um, and um, I laughed through most of my life. That's a pretty good one. Yeah. Good legacy. Yeah. All right. Let, let's wrap up with some rapid fire. All right. I'll ask the question. Just, you just, first thing that comes to mind. Uh, the best part of your day is blank. Fill in the blank. <laughs> Oof. That's fine. I like the mornings. Cup of coffee on the back porch with the dogs. I'd say that's a pretty good, yeah, pretty good spot. And yeah, company to enjoy. Um, cavity back or blade? Oh, blade. I should have known that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love center weighted. I'm I'm still amazed that the metal heads haven't been made center weighted by someone, where you can take the toe over the ball and hook it, or you can bring the heel inside and cut it. Mm-hmm. It's perimeter weight. It's harder to do that. Right. I, I I would think you could still get it hot and still have some ability to move the ball. Someone will do it with mm-hmm. today's world. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you had to pick one club in the world to join, which one would it be? Uh, Prestwick. I've been over there so many times. I adore that. That's a problem. Um, I guess I'll say something. It, it, golf professionals can't join the elite clubs in the UK. Um, they have honoraries, but they're not uh, voting dues-paying members. Um, that goes all the way back to 50, 75 years ahead of, of old Tom. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they, the RNA gave old Tom a membership after he quit playing, um, which is rather strange. But um, on the the beautiful facade of that clubhouse facing the first tee is the embossed face of old Tom. Um, there's no other faces up there. Um, but I'm respectful of that. I, I don't, uh, this is, this is about the traditions. I would like to see that broken down one day. I'd mm-hmm. like to see a club professional. They, you know, we were, we've for 200 years, 300 years in this business been the help and, and not a gentleman. Uh, we're the, we're the, 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 the tradesman was a term I heard once. Uh, too much the tradesman Th- that hurts a little bit frankly uh because i've been in i've been engaged with helping to to bring a, a wonderful spot um online we've given out millions in charity we've moved young people along i, I, I would argue that the golf professional might very well have done more for the game than the amateur uh, mm-hmm. in moving the game along but that's an old world type of thing and uh, that doesn't bother me one of the one of the real one of the most special nights of my entire life i was invited to the mole society which which is the um a society uh, around london a uh, golfing society and uh, they celebrated their centenary at um, royal st george's i was given an invitation to that and um Golf professionals don't get in that room. Black tie affair, really, really special evening. And um, the uh, dear friends here, Mike Ayer and um, uh, Bill Degenhart, uh, had a lot to, to do with that uh, and, and our association with the moles and our association with so many. It's a session and my personal association. The... Uh, I was at the head table that night with Peter Dawson, sat right wow. next to Peter Dawson. And, and the following day in the, in the foursomes match, I was 1A. 
uh, on a shotgun start. Well, that's 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 a, that was incredibly special. And as I stayed that night when I got home from that dinner, I remember feeling like Cinderella. <laughs> you know, I, I got there into that room for a night. I just can't get there at 65. I'm not going to get in there now, but. I hope um, I hope some club professionals break that down at some point. Uh, let's see. Next one, caddy or cart? <laughs> I think you know that one. <laughs> You're sitting at a caddy club for crying out loud. <laughs> one of the two. I'll carts. throw this. I'll <laughs> throw this drink at you. That's kind of like when I asked Conrad uh, the next one, Tiger or Jack. I think Jack's the greatest. Uh, I, I think he, he the numbers bear that out. I think the uh, I, as I said earlier, I absolutely mesmerized by watching tiger he was something special jack didn't didn't do the things tiger did uh jack just knew how to shoot 68 every day Mm -hmm. and on his bad day he shoot 72 um um but tiger dominated um but in the end um the thing that sways me the most are those second and third place finishes yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's unbelievable. 35 or 36 times. So that says volumes yeah. to me. So I, I think if Tiger were to go on and beat him, obviously I think you could say he was the, the, the greatest uh, just on the sheer numbers. But Tiger, I don't think, would ever become close to those second and third no. spots either. I don't so, think he has the time to do it anymore. I don't think so. And <clears throat> regrettably, the body breaks down. That that happens in this game. And um, we've, we've seen that with um, – some of the young guns right now. I remember David Duvall. He 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 got hurt at, when he was number one mm-hmm. and, and never really did quite get it back. Um, um, Rory's struggled a little bit with his his health. He's he's, he's just somewhat fragile. Uh, Jason Day is a perfect example. Yeah, he's he's really had a struggling. lot of problems, and and when he was on, he was absolutely dominant. So, um, uh, but I, it has to be Mr. Nicholas, no doubt. All right, um, and my favorite right there though. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Yeah. Um, you've played a lot of golf courses, a lot of famous golf courses. Are there any that are on your bucket list? Yeah, Cyprus. Cyprus. Um, it, we'll get it done. And, and I would dearly love to go to the sand belt in Australia. I'd like to see that before I'm not able to walk it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but um, uh, not many beyond that. I picked off Chicago Golf Club and Fishers, and um, I played Maidstone this past summer, which I had never played, which was absolutely stunning. I, I couldn't believe how good that was. I wish I had seen it before Mr. Crenshaw got to it. Uh, I think I think Ben did it four or five years ago, mm-hmm. um, uh, something like that. I would have liked to have seen what it looked like beforehand uh, because uh, – I <laughs> It was good. I can remember every shot, every mound, every bunker, every nuance to that golf course. Played it one time. It, it <laughs> was amazing. stunning, <laughs> absolutely stunning. Uh, so, um, no, there's. I, I'm sure uh, there's. There's probably um, one. I haven't played in L.A., uh, so I, I would like to see that. I would love to to go to Bel Air and see Mr. Marins while he's still there. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a delightful man. I've spent a little bit of time with him and just. Loved every second of it. Uh, hopefully, I'll see him at Augusta in a couple of weeks. He was there last year, and we had a chance to catch up. So, uh, uh, But uh, thankfully, um, no, there's not many that I haven't seen. Didn't think so. Um, last rapid fire. If you could have one mulligan, whether it was a golf tournament, uh, a fun round, uh, or life, what, or do you even need one? I, I guess the one thing that stands out to me that I missed on was uh, National Club Pro of the Year. I know from people that were in the room that it was a coin toss. Mm. I would have liked to have had that one, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as taking shots back, no. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. I think it was the I I didn't have it presented to me on a platter. I had to work my butt off. Had the you know the the help of so many friends and family that uh, that got me through it. I worked hard. Understand the the value of work and uh, the the confidence that came with it. Good education. Um, I had um, I've seen everything. But most importantly, I got to 
help put something into play that, as we said earlier, could be historic remains to be seen Mm -hmm. uh, based on the leadership of of this club in the years to come. But I did my job, and uh, I think that's all any man or woman could ever ask. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Do your job and um, uh, do your best. I've I've tried to be uh, kind and, and charitable. I enjoy talking to the to the to the landscaper coming into work as much as I enjoy talking to the CEO of IBM. Uh, no real respecter of persons in that regard. Uh, I think we're here to to enjoy one another and have a, a good time, uh, as I have had uh, in my life, and um, um, you know not dwell on the darker times. Mm-hmm. I've had we've had them as a family. We've had them. Um, um, but uh, through our faith, uh, we've 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 pulled through all of that and um, sit here with um, you know a hundred years from now maybe they'll they'll somebody will say yeah the the old pro had something to do with this. <laughs> I, <And> I, I'm, <laughs> I'm fairly certain they're going to say that. <laughs> if someone wanted to um, get a hold of you or join the club or want more information where's the best place they can do that well they can website, contact me social There's, media you know mem- membership is is by invitation mm-hmm. you know from from within the membership so so that doesn't really wash but uh uh yeah they can they can reach me i don't do social media i don't do any smart other. man i don't I, I don't have the time I, mean, I don't have the time to handle what i've got i can't even fathom having um Twitter accounts and, and <laughs> Facebooks and my God, I, I can't. I, 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 I mean, I, I can't keep up with what I've got. And uh, uh, so no, but uh, and welcome to call anytime. Just just call the club. Yeah, I'll be glad to talk with anybody. Uh, one of the great stories, uh, Eric Kennedy, who's now the pro at Overbrook, uh, once told a, a guy that called the pro shop. He said, "Hey, is the pro in?" And he said, no, he's on the line. And uh, the member said, uh, how long do you think he'll be? And uh, Kennedy said, well, even if it's a wrong number, it's going to be five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> and you knew Kennedy, the sick individual. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, I've always taken my time. I, 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 I think that's the thing that maybe characterized my career. I always took the time. Mm-hmm. To spend with people and, hey. and i'll bypass i'll bypass the the uh, somebody wanting to send me a check for membership in lieu of spending time with uh, members and guests as much as members really uh family friends uh, anybody in need so uh no if somebody needs to talk they can call all right this has been great you've always been so generous with with uh me and so many others with your time i can't thank you enough and uh i've re- Greatly, greatly appreciate this. Well, thank Thank you, you, Peter. It's an honor. Awesome. Thank you. Beautiful. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed it, you can find more information on today's episode and other topics at golf360.blog. There you'll find the show notes and links, links related to this episode, as well as any other episode that we've done so far to date. If you're interested in improving your game and would like to learn more, from yours truly by taking a private lesson, a half day or multi day school, club or putter fitting, you can reach me through the blog site or by email pete at golf360.blog. So, some of you may be asking, what is the golf paradigm? All you have to do is click on the home page while on my blog site to discover how you can start playing better than you ever thought possible. Or you can simply sign up again on the blog page for my instructional videos where I give regular tips on all areas of the game to include the swing, club design and fitting, health, fitness and nutrition, the mental aspects, and equally as important, the integration of all those things together. I'm also on social media, and you can find me at The Golf Paradigm. That's P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M. And I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, also under the same name, The Golf Paradigm. Facebook is usually the best way to reach me for questions and or comments, and I look forward to hearing what all of you have to say.